These members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 3pm. Welcome to the Martin Dorby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, more immigration madness has been revealed that the government intends to shell out a staggering 36 million quid on private boats to pick up channel migrants. And meanwhile, starting in about 15 minutes' time, the Rwanda deportation plan comes under scrutiny in the House of Lords. Will they plot to sink it? And two people have now died and thousands are still without power following the devastation caused by Storm Aisha. Many parts of the UK remain under a severe weather warning. We'll have updates from all of the worst hit areas. And the BBC faces tougher scrutiny over alleged bias. And this comes out of complaints against the corporation rose last year by more than 50%. Today I'll be asking, is the BBC fit for purpose? And more than 300 schools have been told to stop calling pupils boys and girls after signing up to a scheme run by a controversial trans rights group. That's all coming up in your next hour. OK, and before all that, here's your latest news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Martin, thank you very much. One minute past three, your top stories from the GB newsroom. Breaking news, a five-day strike by LNER train drivers next month has been called off. It comes as members of the Aslev Union prepare to launch a series of strikes and an overtime ban from January 29th in their long-running dispute over pay. London North East Railway drivers were due to walk out from the 5th of February amid speculation about new minimum service level regulations. A man in his 60s has died in a road collision involving two vans and a fallen tree in County Londonderry. A storm Isha hit. Police in Northern Ireland confirmed the incident took place last night. That's after an 84-year-old man died after a car crashed into a fallen tree in Falkirk in Scotland. Storm Isha has wreaked havoc for commuters with trains and planes cancelled and now another storm is now on its way. The next storm of the season has been named a Storm Jocelyn, set to bring strong winds and heavy rain from tomorrow into Wednesday, with yellow and amber warnings in place across much of the UK. Downing Street denies the government's pursuing an agenda against the BBC after announcing a raft of reforms as part of a review into the corporation. Under new plans, Ofcom could gain more powers over BBC News website articles as it does not meet relevant broadcast standards. Currently, the watchdog is only able to issue an opinion on the matter. However, government recommendations say it'll be given increased oversight over the BBC's online public services, including its news site and YouTube channel. The Prime Minister's spokesman says the proposed measures were rightly about ensuring the BBC is able to continue to thrive long into the future. Rishi Sunak says BBC News is not immune to scrutiny. Impartiality is an important tenet of our media industry and that's why you know, I think all, all elements of the media industry have to be subject to the same impartiality rules. I think it's what people would expect and that's what makes our media institutions so great. I mean, we have a free and fair press and impartiality is at the heart of what makes the BBC a strong institution. 
A 13-year-old boy who died after he was deliberately pushed into a river was pushed in as part of a prank. It comes after 19-year-old Jaden Pugh insisted he slipped into Christopher Capessa, causing him to fall into the river in Wales in July 2019. South Wales Central Coroner's Court heard there was a dispute over whether he'd been pushed into the water from a ledge. Christopher has been described by his family as loving, caring, passionate and very protective. Ofsted inspections are resuming in schools in England after pausing to ensure inspectors were given mental health training. Ofsted's new boss delayed inspections at the start of term following the inquest into the suicide of Ruth Perry. She took her own life in January last year after her school was downgraded from outstanding to inadequate. New Ofsted guidance will allow school visits to be paused if staff show signs of distress. British farmers are calling on MPs to support tougher regulations to protect them from what they're calling unfair treatment by the so-called Big Six supermarkets. A dozen scarecrows have been placed outside Parliament as MPs debate reforms to the grocery supply chain. It's after 110,000 people signed a petition urging the government to overhaul the grocery supplies code of practice. Riverford Organic, who started that petition, say the scarecrows represent farmers who claim they could go out of business in the next 12 months, blaming supermarkets' buying practices. The families of victims held in captivity by the Hamas terror group have stormed Israel's parliament. They flooded a finance committee meeting, demanding lawmakers do more to try to free their loved ones. One woman held up pictures of three family members who were among the 253 people seized in the cross-border Hamas rampage on the 7th of October. The UK government has vowed to continue with its support of a two-state solution in the Middle East, as Israel's Prime Minister says no and that he will not compromise. Rishi Sunak's reportedly due to meet with families of Israeli hostages in the UK today. The Duchess of York says she's in shock but remains in good spirits after being diagnosed with skin cancer. Sarah Ferguson says she's taking some time to herself after having several moles removed, with one being identified as cancerous. It's just months after undergoing treatment for breast cancer. She's thanked well wishes and medical staff for the support that she's been given. And the Queen has toured a domestic violence refuge to celebrate the service's 50th anniversary. Her Majesty met staff, volunteers and families at Swindon Domestic Abuse Support Service. And during her visit, Queen Camilla told a well-wisher the King is fine as he prepares to undergo treatment for an enlarged prostate this week. The 75-year-old monarch says he's keen to go public with his condition to encourage other men to get checked. Those are your top stories on GB News across the UK on TV, in your car on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying play GB News. Now back to Martin. Thank you, Tatiana. And there's loads to get through this hour. A busy, busy show ahead. I'm going to stick it off with illegal migration, which has come under the spotlight again today because the Rwanda deportation plan is under scrutiny in the House of Lords this afternoon. In fact, at about 10 minutes' time, the first of a lengthy series of debates kicks off. Meanwhile, it's been revealed that the Home Office spends around 36 million quid on private boats to help the border force pick up migrants in the Channel. The vessels are being leased on a temporary basis because of a two-year delay in its plans to replace the UK's current fleet of border force cutters. We've also learned that nearly 16,000 asylum seekers, including those who cross the channel in small boats illegally, have been allowed to work in a single year. They've been working in occupations in which there are recognised staff shortages and are paid 80% of the going rates to do so. Even The Guardian are calling this slave labour. Well, let's speak now to our political editor, Chris Vobe, and I'm also joined in the studio. My great pleasure to have Sir John Redwell, but first to you, Chris. So, a lengthy <laughs> debating process, a lengthy debating process kicks off in about 10 minutes' time in the Lords. We spoke about this last week, led by Lord Goldsmith, who would like to table a series of amendments which basically could mean months and months of delay. The beginning of trying to slow down the Rwanda plan is starting. The government says it wants to get these first flights off in May this year, in, sp in the spring. 
Today is all about trying to. Uh, it's uh, the International Agreements Committee. You never heard of it, Nord High, until uh, Nord High and I until I came on the show. Essentially, it's a, it's a committee in the laws which wants the government uh, to delay ratifying uh, the treaty with Rwanda until it is, it is actually safe. Until the things we know that will, will take place, look after people flown there, deported there. That yeah, they, that's that's happening, and that could delay it for months and months and months. I think this is a side issue to the main meat of the consideration of the Rwanda bill, which will be in about ten days' time. Mm. And that's when it really will start. I've been talking to uh, rebels who re re rebelled uh, last week, the, what, some of the, of the 11 or sources close to them. They think it will be mauled and the laws will come back barely recognisable. Yes. It'll be up to the government's supporters and the government's MPs to, to reach to change that bill and make it, put it back to where it was last week, which of course some would say won't mm. work anyway. And it sounds like an unholy coalition of Labour, Lib Dems and One Nation Tories would do their very best to derail this mm. and give Rishi a major headache. Let's talk about this 36 million quid mm. um, being spent on private boats to back up I think that, that's border the, force. That's less concerning, though, I think, because essentially... Well, it, it is the taxpayers. Yes, but they, they, they're doing it because they can't get a boat built on time. So, essentially, they're <laughs> saying, we can't get the boat built, let's spend the money on, on uh, chartering so vessels. So, the only boats they can the stop are the boats they can't build in time. Well, in a sense, I, I just think that if they, if they, rather than say, we're not going to do it at all, they are trying to do it with, with a chartered vessel. I mean, it's not working, Martin. <laughs> we know the numbers. Hundreds arriving last week. Yeah, and at the weekend, this astonishing revelation that 16,000 yeah. of those who arrived, some of whom would have arrived illegally, have been granted work visas in, in the care sector, in construction, in agriculture. A lot of people saying this is just a red carpet being rolled out to people smugglers. The problem is, it's, it's the pull factor. So if you're in France looking at the UK, what you see there is if you arrive in the UK, you get put up in a hotel and you get work, albeit at 80% uh, of the going rate. That is still a way to get established in this mm. country illegally. And that's the problem, I think, for a lot of people on the, on the right of this debate. They think, why on earth are we allowing this to happen? Put, them up, put people up in hotels, or, or, or some are going on the bivvy mm. bars, not many. How can this be right? OK, Chris, um, stick around. Let's turn to Sir John Redwood now, if I could. Sir John, thank you for coming to the studio. Always a pleasure. A lot of conversation around illegal immigration, but of course, you've been focused, rightly so, for, for a long time on the thorny topic of legal migration, which, of course, is a far greater topic and far costlier to the tax well, indeed. I mean, over 700,000 compared with 30,000 of illegals are all invited in, all on this cheap labour model. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much against it. I think we should say that we want higher wages, higher productivity in the United Kingdom. We need to offer training and support and better wages to all the people who are already here, who, who are of working age, who are not working. The government has some ideas on that. And I think it's quite wrong to let employers bring people in on discount wages to depress the wage level that we see here. Uh, and they say it's cheap labour, but it isn't cheap for the taxpayer. And this is the big mm. point I've been making in the debate. Mm. Uh, the EU tried to work out how much uh, a migrant would cost an EU country in terms of the capital cost of providing a flat and the capital cost for school places and health provision and then the early years public service costs, they said a quarter of a million euros in 2016. I've been trying to get the government to either stack up my quarter of a million pounds or come up with their own figure. Mm. But when you realise it's that amount of money, no wonder we're very short on yeah. public spending. Mm. And I see it in my own area where we've had to put in three new primary schools to cope with all the extra people coming to our part of the world, there has to be some limit on the numbers. Mm. Chris? Why has your government allowed it to happen? <laughs> Tens of thousands was a target back in 2010, and now, it's, as you say, it's 700,000 700, plus legally arriving here net. Well, they shouldn't, and I'm very pleased the Prime Minister now said he wants to reverse that, and he's come up with proposals to take 300,000 off, but when you're starting from <laughs> 700, that, that isn't enough because no. we're still nowhere near where we were in 2019. And I think the reason it happened, as you know, Chris, is that everybody had a good case. You know, we need some extra care workers, we need some extra farm workers, we, ne we need some extra technology workers. Uh, but they shouldn't bring in so many. And if these are temporary shortages, you solve the shortage. They did a very good job on drivers. We were very short of drivers mm. because of the big move to online deliveries over COVID and all the rest of it. Mm. And they went off and they put in the extra training places. They got the extra licenses granted. They put the wages up. 
and a lot of that shortage went away. That's what they should be doing in the care sector, that's what they should be doing in the farm sector, mm. higher productivity, higher wages, and spend the public money on helping people do the investment in Britain. Don't spend so much public money on trying to backfill the need for all these but, extra provisions. But isn't the problem now the care sector, agriculture, construction, hospitality, and many other sectors, they're addicted to cheap labour. They've had a tap of it for so long. Even The Guardian on today's front page is saying it's slave labour to get care workers and 80% of wages. Of course it is. You've got, the, you've got The Guardian agreeing with people like yourselves that this <laughs> is wrong, but nobody seems to have an idea how to fix it. The government could just switch off those visa numbers overnight, though, couldn't you? Well, of course they could, and, and I'm urging them to do something more than that. Uh, I think there is huge public support from Labour as well as Conservative voters for the idea of a higher wage, higher productivity model. Um, being paid more for doing more because you've got technology and support mm. and better systems and so forth. And, mm. and we could make huge breakthroughs. Indeed, in the public services, we've had a shocking 7.5% productivity collapse, mm. according to the official figures, since 2019. Mm. And we need that back. That's 30 billion or more mm. extra payments to achieve the same amount. We can't go on like that. So they must put all their efforts, the government, into productivity and into supporting it with investment and then they'll get a lot of savings because they won't need so many new, new school places and so many mm. extra subsidised homes to mm. accept in 700,000. I mean, the way I put it is that if you're going to carry on at 700,000, you need to build three cities the size of Southampton mm. every year. Yeah. And you don't just have to build the flats, you've got to build the yeah. shops yes. and the utilities yeah, the schools, and the, roads, and the schools everything. and everything. Yeah, yeah. Chris. It, it just sounds so frustrating, doesn't it, to many, many viewers? I mean, is the problem the lack of any, any eating into that large benefits bill, the millions on benefits, is, is, is the kind of the, 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 the well, issue? Well, that's the other win that I'm talking about. And, and I think Mark Stride and the Chancellor have now got mm. some good ideas on how mm. people could want to come off benefits because they're going to be better paid and they get support. And you can do much more homeworking now. So if you've got special needs, mm. it may be we can fit you up so you can do quite a lot of the work at home, which would, would be great. These are the amount of things they want to do. But they're being delayed. And I don't know why they don't get on with it. We're talking about doing some of these things in 2025. No government, do it now. Mm. We've got the labour shortages now. We've got so many vacancies now. Let's try and match the people to the vacancies. So, John Redwood, you've had your wheat to bix Superb. Thank you very much. Excellent stuff. And to you, Chris. Um, thank you very much. So, let's just quickly move on. Join me now. We've had John Redwood. Join me now as the Labour MP. Graham. No, we're going back to Chopper because we've got our, we've got our Labour MP there. We have to do a crossover. What do you make of that? He's, he's very um, on fire about it. But you were dead right to say that basically this has been going on for years, it's been going on under a Conservative government, it's been going on their watch. It's good to talk tough, but in actual fact... Well, we asked Labour what's, their, what's their net figure. They won't put numbers on it, they're waiting until they get here. It's all about, really, most people think the Treasury drive this. They want around um, roughly a quarter of a million people arriving here net um, to, to keep the economic growth on the same trajectory and, and almost ignoring these figures, being these people being allow, allowed to languish on benefits. And yeah. many, many will try and get back into working cars. It's not, not worth doing so because of the way the benefit system is structured. That's the challenge for this government or the next one. But I do think, you know, this is all really on Boris Johnson's time, these big numbers, the big net figures. He was very relaxed about these big net migration figures coming in, and yeah. I think it's on him. But, of course, we go back to, don't we, to David Cameron, who wanted to bring down to 10, under 100,000. 100, and now mm. it's seven times that. And it's funny how, you know, you've got people like Richard Ty saying one in, one out. Mm. I know you had a clash with him last week, but that really means about 400,000? Yeah, because over, 400... over the five-year period, he'd, he'd allow 400,000 yeah. net, you know, if he would and get anywhere near the range of power. It's quite simplistic, though, because, of course, employers want certain bespoke skills and employers drive it half the time. But surely that must be achievable. That, that's a large number. It's way, way above the tens of thousands mm. that the Conservatives promised all those years it ago. probably will get, get down to that number. When you take out the numbers of, uh, of uh, people arriving here from Hong Kong, those from Ukraine, if you if you do allow the removal of these spousal visas, which the PM is, is talking about, it may fall to that figure anyway, but that's still a lot of lot of people, mm. as John Randall was saying. Mm. OK, thank you very much. Now, joining me now is Labour MP Graham Stringer. Graham, thanks for joining us in the studio. So let's turn to this Lords debate. It kicks off round about now, actually, being led by um, Lord Goldsmith, of course, Labour Blair's former Attorney General. He's already said that this should not be ratified. It should be delayed. It seems like the Lords is doing its level best to sink Sunak's plan. I, I agree with you. Um, 
I think if we turn back to the Commons and the votes uh, last week, if you listen to what people said, particularly Conservative MPs as opposed to the way they voted, uh, there's a natural majority in the Commons against this bill. It was the last minute uh, that the Whips got 40 Tories or thereabouts who didn't support the bill really uh, with threats and under duress to, to support them. But it was voted through in the it Commons. It was voted through and there is obviously a constitutional issue between the Commons and, and the laws. But I, I think as background, the reality is a majority of MPs uh, see this bill as it is at the moment as irrelevant in dealing with a real problem. Do you think it's fair the critics are saying that Lord Ash, um, Goldsmith um, and Lab Lib Dem peers have already sort of said that they will team up, as it were, and then we have the One Nation Conservatives. The Tories, of course, don't hold a majority in the Lords, so this might start to feel to voters once again like Brexit all over again. The Lords is there to frustrate the will of Parliament and ultimately frustrate the will of the people. Well, I, I have grave reservations about that and when we were given a vote in the Commons about different alternatives for the Lords, I voted to abolish them and would do that uh, again. I, I think there is something fundamentally wrong in our Constitution uh, when unelected people can frustrate uh, legislation passed by the Commons and in mani manifestos. Mm. I also worry about, hopefully, uh, there will be a Labour government and a, the, a, an incoming Labour government won't have a majority in the mm. Lords mm. and I don't want there to be a precedent set uh, that their lordships can frustrate uh, a brand new Labour government. So that there are real issues there. But as I say, I mean, at the background of this, this is a dreadful bill that people right, left and centre don't think will work. Mm. OK, Chris. Well, do you worry, though, that if it does work, if, if uh, numbers are taken off in their hundreds, maybe after May, June, let's say that happens, and Labour comes in, Labour will then remove that idea, that the whole idea, the whole idea of trying to put off and break these people smuggling gangs? I can't speak for an incoming Labour government, but I would be very surprised uh, if it worked. If it did work and it had happened, because the essential argument by the government is this is a threat. Once we threaten these people, uh, they will stop coming. I don't believe that. Uh, people who are willing to risk themselves and their children to cross the channel, and many of them sadly have lost their lives, uh, I don't think are going to be put off by the tiny possibility of being shipped off, uh, shipped off uh, to Rwanda. If they're not going to be put off by Rwanda, do you think they may be encouraged, or it might be a pull factor? Today, we found out, 36 million quid is going to be spent on boats to aid people people ashore. That's hardly stopping the boat. <laughs> it's extraordinary. I didn't know about it until I was invited onto this programme. It's <laughs> extraordinary. Uh, it seems to me, I, I looked at the figures uh, and what uh, was going on, and the Home Office produced very exact figures, presumably from these uh, boats, about how many people land. I didn't realise that they were mm. paying people to help them until recently. The, the Home Office, I don't think, have their hearts and minds in the government's policies. They seem more interested in watching and aiding uh, rather than implementing. I mean, I, again, across the whole of the House of Commons, nobody is happy with these boats uh, crossing the channels, it seems to me, apart from officials in the Home Office. OK, Graham, briefly, we could Sir Keir Starmer today accusing the Tory party of a kind of McCarthyism, stoking up woke culture wars, as he puts it, talking about the National Trust, but also the Royal National Lifeboat Institute, part of this issue, of course. Is that a fair thing for Starmer to say? A lot of people are concerned that the great British institutions are becoming more woke, they're undermining British history. Is this an indication that Starmer is going to be in bed with that kind of mindset? I hope not. I genuinely hope not. And it's very difficult to answer that question because I, I know what's happened in the National Trust uh, and I know what's happened in the lifeboat services and other parts of the public sector. I think it's much easier to deal with those questions on a, an item by item, detail by detail uh, question rather than are you woke or anti woke. I, I, I think some of the things the National Trust have done have been, uh, well, they've distorted history really, not to the advantage of, uh, of our country, and I think that's wrong. But I'd prefer to discuss that rather than saying, are they woke, are they naughty and woke? Mm. We should push them off. These are detailed things that should be discussed in detail. OK, thank you very much, Labour MP Graham Stringer and Chris Vogue. Thank you very much. Great top of the show. Now, coming up, there's still weather warnings in place after many parts of Britain were battered by Storm Aisha. We'll get updates from some of the worst-hit areas. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel.
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. 3.27. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, storm ice has now cleared, but winds close to 100 miles an hour battered the UK as bad weather swept across Britain. The Met Office has warned of a continuing danger to lives from flying debris, with thousands suffering from power cuts and flooding. Sadly, two deaths have now been confirmed as a result of the storm, and the UK isn't going to get much relief from Storm Aisha. A storm jostling is forecast to bring in strong winds and heavy rain to the UK tomorrow and into Wednesday. Well, we're joined now by our North Line reporter, Doogie Beattie, in Port Stewart, and our North West of England reporter, Sophie Reaper, who is in Blackpool. Doogie, coming to you first. What's the latest? Well, I'm actually, I've moved from Port Stewart down to Belfast Lock. And yes, as you said, rather sadly, uh, a man in his 60s lost his life last night on the Colrean Limavady Shore Road. There was a collision with two vans and a fallen tree. That was right in the, in the mouth of McGilligan, uh, where winds were recorded of up to 80 miles an hour. Uh, I was trying to do a live there last night, and I, I was finding it hard to stay on my feet. But yeah, Northern Ireland has took quite the hammering 
It's still about 40,000 homes without power. The Republic of Ireland took the worst of it, it must be said. There's about 235,000 properties this morning had no power there either. And of course, this has brought uh, real problems to the infrastructure of Northern Ireland, uh, but it, it is used to it. Uh, the electricity companies here are very well rehearsed in getting power back to those that need it the most. And of course, those that need it the most are in the most populated areas. They're on first. But of course, those in the country areas are having to wait. And as you've said, a next storm is on its way in. I mean, even now, sitting here, there has been squally showers coming in. You can feel the, the uh, wind getting up once again and starting to come in to uh, Belfast Lock. And of course, Belfast Lock last night, rather unfortunately, the Stenaline Ferry from Liverpool had to circle for nearly 10 hours out in the mouth of the lock because it couldn't dock here. So really, Northern Ireland, just as it's going to get back up and running again, it is look, looking like it's going to be hit once. Okay, thank you, Doogie Beatty from Belfast. Now let's cross now to Sophie Reaper, who's in Blackpool. Sophie, looking very windy there, blowing a hoolie. What's the latest? It is indeed a really rather iconic sight here over my shoulder, but I can tell you that throughout all of last night and throughout all of today, it has been absolutely battered by storm, by the storm itself. The waves have been crashing in on the flood defences. The rain came in earlier. The temperature has plummeted. So whether or not we're seeing the end of storm Aisha or we're starting to see storm Jocelyn, you mentioned there, we're starting to see the impacts of that here in Blackpool. I'm not sure, but it's certainly one or the other. We obviously overnight were in the amber weather warning. That was downgraded by the Met Office this morning. But we are still in a yellow wind warning, which means there is potential danger to life from flying debris. We've seen all manner of things flying around here in Blackpool today. Uh, there's also the risk of power cuts. Uh, many people have been left without power across the nation today. There's also been major disruption in the travel sector. Flights grounded, trains cancelled, roads closed. It has really been carnage here in the northwest but also all over the UK and it looks as though there really isn't going to be any kind of respite for people in the nation as we're now set to see storm Jocelyn set in in the coming hours. Okay Sophie Reaper in Blackpool and Doogie BT in Belfast thank you for those updates on Storm Aisha. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and four o'clock, and the BBC faces tougher scrutiny over bias. And this comes after complaints against the corporation rocketed by 50% in a year. And we'll have Nadine Doris, the former culture secretary, right after this. That should get spicy. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Martin, thank you. 3.31, your top stories from the GB Newsroom. A five-day strike by LNER train drivers next month has been called off. It comes as members of ASLEV prepare to launch a series of strikes and an overtime ban from the 29th of January in their long-running dispute over pay. London North East railway drivers were due to walk out from the 5th of February amid speculation about new minimum service level regulations. A man in his 60s has died in a road collision involving two vans and a fallen tree in County Londonderry, a storm Isha hit. Police in Northern Ireland confirmed the incident took place last night. That's after an 84-year-old man died when a car crashed into a fallen tree in Falkirk in Scotland. Storm Isha has wreaked havoc for commuters with trains and planes cancelled. Now another storm is on its way. That next storm has been named as Storm Jocelyn and is expected to bring strong winds and heavy rain into Wednesday, with yellow and amber warnings in place across much of the UK. Downing Street denies the government pursuing an agenda against the BBC after announcing a raft of reforms as part of a review into the corporation. Under new plans, Ofcom could gain more powers over BBC News website articles as it doesn't meet relevant broadcast standards. Currently, the watchdog is only able to issue an opinion on the matter. However, government recommendations say it will be given increased oversight over the BBC's online public services, including its news site and YouTube channel. And the Queen has toured a domestic violence refuge to celebrate the service's 50th anniversary. 
Her Majesty met staff, volunteers and families at Swindon Domestic Abuse Support Service. And during her visit, Queen Camilla told a well-wisher the King is fine as he prepares to undergo treatment for an enlarged prostate this week. The 75-year-old King Charles says he's keen to go public with his condition to encourage other men to get checked. You can get more on all of those stories by visiting our website, gbnews.com. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2730 and €1.1684. The price of gold is £1,591.72 per ounce and the FTSE 100 is at 7,486 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Tatiana. Now, the BBC is to get tougher scrutiny on their online content over concerns about bias within the organisation. And that's according to Lucy Fraser, who has said audiences think the corporation is not sufficiently impartial. The culture secretary was also asked about GB News during her appearance on Radio 4 this morning. Let's turn to uh, another part of the broadcasting landscape, which is GB News. Um, while loss-making, GB News has built a, a significant following, both on linear TV and online. Would you agree with the assertion that it has transformed our broadcasting landscape? I'm in favour of media plurality, and what that means is that there's a wide variety of views across um, uh, out there for people to watch and listen to, so that audiences uh, can find the views that they want to hear. And GB News is an important part of that landscape. It's decided to be regulated by Ofcom, as indeed many other broadcasters have, but I think it's really important that we have that uh, variety of views. There we go. The BBC are criticised and they criticise GB News. Textbook. So join me now as former Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, Nadine Doris. Welcome to the show, Nadine. Superb to have you yeah, on. Thanks. So this must be like Groundhog Day for you. Um, here we are again. Culture Secretary Lucy Fraser saying the BBC must adapt, reform or risk losing the trust of the audience it relies upon. You've been saying this for years. Do you think the BBC is completely broken? Yeah, and sadly, what's been announced today is just too little, too late. And it's no coincidence that it's been announced just when we're in an election year. But of course, there's very little time to put anything into practice or into place. What's happened now, just to be clear, is legally, and under the bindings of the Royal Charter, the midterm review has to be launched. And what you had today was to coincide with the launch of the midterm review, because it'd be quite bizarre to launch the midterm review of the BBC Royal Charter without any announcements to accompany it. But I think what is more important and what was said today really covers up is this. There was a review that was due to be launched about how the BBC is funded and the BBC licence fee. And that was delayed by Rishi Sunak over and over. It was blocked when he was Chancellor. He actually said to me, no, you can't do this because it's a taxation policy and taxation policy is the Treasury. It isn't a taxation policy, mm -hmm. but he blocked and blocked it. And last, a few weeks ago in December, on a busy news day, the government slipped out onto its website that it has launched the review. But it said... The review would be undertaken by an independent panel of experts, and they have yet to announce who that is. And I think the most important thing that we can deduce from that today is, despite all these other announcements, with no backup as to when it's happening and how the accountability is going to be displayed, to be, are we going to, how we're going to know that Ofcom are holding the online presence of the BBC social media. The most important thing is this. But as a result of the government holding up that review of the BBC licence fee, the licence fee is here to stay. Because there is no way, I was told when I was culture secretary, it would take at least three years to bring a change about. They have deliberately stalled until now, until it is therefore not possible to change the BBC funding model. So the BBC licence fee is here to stay and it will continue to rise and people will, 3,500 prosecutions a month are taking place, people will still be prosecuted 
the most vulnerable people the non-payment of the licence fee. That is the shocking piece of news about the BBC. That's not what anyone is talking about, and that's what's been buried, if you like, by this window dressing today of the fact that Ofcom will be holding the BBC to account for its online content. Yeah, and of course you referred to a report in yesterday, Sunday Times, Nadine, three and a half thousand a month licence fears are being, are being prosecuted, often in closed courts without any chance of representation, including disabled people, those in wheelchairs who just missed a single payment, and indeed people that paid their payments for them may themselves have been through bereavement. This paints a picture, doesn't it, Nadine, of, of, of a heartless, uncaring organisation only intent on making profit at any cost. Yeah, and I think it's um, it's it's a, the problem with the BBC. It is a huge organisation, and it's grown beyond its own ability to control itself and to regulate itself. It's mm. got too big, and you know when you have large organisations, whether it's the BBC or the NHS, that a, a culture develops and a culture grows, and it becomes the culture becomes so huge that it doesn't matter who you've got at the top, they just can no longer, it becomes a monster mm. and it's a monster they can't control and that is what has happened with the BBC. And you know, those 3,500 prosecutions per month, 76% of those are women. And why is that? Mm. It's because women quite often take responsibility for household bills, particularly those in single parent households. They're the women who take responsibility and pay the bills and they're the ones who are being prosecuted. And it's, you know, it doesn't matter how often I come on TV stations like yours or how often I write about it in my column in the Daily Mail, it still continues to just roll on as it is. Nothing takes place and it's to change the process. And, and that's what we're stuck with now. We're stuck with the BBC licence fee. We've probably got an incoming Labour government. It will never change. The licence fee will continue to have to pay more for it. And the BBC, will, Ofcom's best efforts, will continue just as it is. Uh OK, Nadine, you say it will never change, but a lot of people do want it to change, and you're one of them. In fact, in 2022, you were saying the current model is completely outdated and the, BBC, the Ofcom should hold the BBC to account and we need a completely new way of funding the BBC. What would you like to see happen? So the review, which I had ready to go on the day Boris Johnson was... We were ready to launch that the following week, um, should have been launched years ago. I mean... What I want to see happen has been timed out. Um, I mean, if we get a Conservative government next time, then maybe we can go again. But I can promise you that an incoming Labour government will do nothing to reform the BBC in any substantial way that will impact on individuals paying the licence fee or in having to listen to content which lacks impartiality. You know, the Dyson review, which took place well, three, four years ago now, found the BBC lacked impartiality. The BBC launched its own 10-point impartiality plan in response to the Dyson review to address those issues. We've just had the Hamas-Israeli conflict. Did we see that 10-point impartiality plan playing through when the presenters refused to call Hamas a terrorist organisation? No, we didn't. And so it has made no difference. And I'm afraid, it, you know, it frustrates me. And I had the full backing of the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, in launching the review of the BBC licence fee and in finding an innovative way of funding the BBC without losing those core functions of the BBC, which are important. You know, it is important to say the BBC is a beacon of broadcasting across the globe. Without losing those core functions, how could we how could we make it better value for people in the UK who are having to pay ever-increasing costs? I had his full backing, um, but I didn't have the backing of the Chancellor Rishi Sunak. And it doesn't appear that the people have the backing of Rishi Sunak now because this is just window dressing and the BBC licence fee is here to stay. Superb, great food for thought. Nadine Doris, former Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Thank you for joining us on GB News. Superb stuff. Now, coming up, more than 300 schools have been told to stop calling pupils boys and girls after signing up to a scheme run by controversial trans rights lobbying group Stonewall. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? In your mouth. OK. Here comes a, here comes a train. <laughs> Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Carson, this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. 3.46, you're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, LGBTQ plus charity Stonewall is telling schools not to call pupils boys or girls. Instead, the lobby group is urging them to use children or young people. And teachers should use they instead of he or she. It's all about the pronouns. I'm joined now by Miranda Yardley, who's a human rights activist. Miranda, welcome to the show. Always a voice of common sense. I've got a basic question for you. Why is it inclusive to use they, them pronouns and stop calling humans boys or girls in schools when only at, a, at an optimistic estimation there are 0.5% of the population who is trans? So surely it is exclusionary to 99.5% of the population to go down this route? It's only inclusive in the sense that it is part of the diversity, equality, inclusion, industrial complex that has taken over uh, the, um, the, the way, the systems, the way a lot of public services are now run. Um, what, what this is doing is it's importing this very damaging gender identity ideology into schools and taking away from children the ability to describe themselves as boys or girls to to correctly sex themselves to to be able to say what they actually are instead of follow some uh, some sort of generic imprecise language is mm. um is is 
not want to bring up a, a trope about Orwell or anything, but this is exactly what Orwell wrote about mm. in his essay, Politics in the English Language. It's all about taking meaning away from words and uh, and allowing, really, it's, a, it's, it's all about allowing this very damaging ideology to be imported into schools and other services. It's interesting you mentioned the word damaging because I was going to ask you next, Brenda, is there any evidence that any of this is making children happier? Because my own children who go to school have this stuff rammed down their throats. They're confused. They're frightened of saying the wrong thing. It's dividing peer groups. It's causing people to be more exclusive and terrified. Where is the good in it? Uh, that's a really, really good question. Uh, I, th there is, there is no good in it. It's not. It, it doesn't work for anybody. I would say that this doesn't even work for trans-identified people either, because what's what people what's actually happening here is this type of ideology is being rammed down people's throats. Uh, rather than them being allowed to make up their own mind, I would imagine that most most people, your average individual would be uh, c compassionate and tolerant of people living their lives the way that they want to. Um, th and I think people should be allowed to make up their own decisions about doing things like that without having an, an ideology ra rammed into them, uh, as especially something that is being done amongst children. There are specific protections within the education acts that are there to afford protection and dignity for 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 girls and for boys as well to allow mm. them to have um separate facilities and to enjoy um sports separately so competition is fair and okay. to, to allow them the ability to change um you know you know to to change um w without being amongst people of the opposite sex and what's actually happening here is that these the protection and the dignity that's being afforded them by the law is being taken away by this absolutely awful organisation, Stonewall, who doesn't even bat for lesbians and gay men anymore. The official line from the former CEO was that anybody who any anybody who is um, same sex attracted and uh, uh, rather than being attracted to gender is guilty of some form of sexual apartheid. OK, we have to leave it there. Miranda Yardley, superb common sense as ever. Boys will be boys and girls will be girls. Thank you very much. Now, a taxi driver in Shropshire has won his appeal to display the Union flag on the bonnet of his taxi. Basil Brockhurst, who served in the British Army in Northern Ireland and Iraq, had been told by Shropshire Council to remove the flag, stating it was against the council's licensing policy. Well, joining me now is author and social cohesion expert Raki Bassan. Welcome to the show, Raki. Hello, mate. So, once again, it's the war on the Union flag. Why? Oh, I think this is just uh, disgraceful, really. We're talking about a man who served in our military for the best part of four decades, three tours in Northern Ireland, uh, served in Iraq as well. All he wants to do is put a Union flag and a St George's flag on his taxi. But it seems like a, council, a local councillor seems to have a serious issue with it, saying that it's... I believe, potentially divisive. And I think of all the things in our society which are divisive, this certainly isn't mine. Yeah, and actually, the Union flag is a flag that brings the United Kingdom together. It's the opposite of divisive. It's actually totally inclusive. But what is it, Rakib, about the woke mindset that hates our flag so much? Well, I, I think that many people uh, of that uh, political persuasion if you could call it that, they have a fundamentally warped view of British history, heritage and its traditions. And it extends further when it comes to race relations and its record on matters of equality, which is why they see the Union flag almost as a symbol of oppression. Uh, w which is quite laughable, really. But ultimately, th th this is this is a freedom of expression issue as well. Mm. We, we have a gentleman who, as I said, served in our military for the best part of four decades. All he wants to do is put a Union flag and the St George's flag on his own vehicle. And I think that for a local council to intervene in something like that, I mean, we're not talking about flags of prescribed organisations, are we? We're talking about the Union flag and the St George's flag. I find it quite remarkable that... 
um, local authorities would intervene in such a way. Yeah, and presumably they're quite happy oftentimes with the Palestinian flag being flown above town halls or the Ukrainian flag, but they seem to have a particular chagrin for our own flag. No, absolutely. I, I think that all too often when it comes to public buildings, I think there have been, there've been too many flags which have been displaced, uh, displayed, uh, in, in my opinion. I, I think more generally what it says, you call it woke mindset, um, mind. but it, for, for me, the sort of radical progressive mindset, there's ultimately a self-loathing there, uh, a vilification of Britain, what it stands for, a fundamentally warped view of its history, which is why it feels like it needs to intervene in such a way. This, the, the union flag is a symbol, as you say, is, is, is a unity. Um, it, it, one of the most inclusive societies on earth. That's an argument that I've made on a number of occasions. And it's such a shame that people could look at the union flag and their instant reaction would be, this is potentially divisive and offensive, and we should intervene when okay. a former man who served in the military just wants to put in his own taxi. OK, Rakib Hassan, we have to leave it there. Speaking common sense, as usual, have much more on that, that, plus that debate in the laws on Rwanda. Coming up after this, I'm Martin Dorbney on GB News. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Afternoon, I'm Alex Deakin. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Storm Isha is out of the way, but Storm Jocelyn is on the way for later tomorrow with the strongest winds across the northern half of the UK. There is Isha exiting up towards Norway, but Jocelyn is brewing out in the Atlantic. We're between these two storm systems at the moment. Still quite windy out there this evening. Plenty of showers being blown in on that brisk wind as well. Some heavy ones continuing over Scotland, but for many places it'll become dry and clear overnight. And the winds will continue to ease down a little. That could allow temperatures to get down to freezing in rural parts of Scotland, but for most of us, we'll stay a little above freezing at three or four Celsius. Here comes the next area of rain, though. A wet start for Northern Ireland. That rain will spread into Wales and southwest England before dawn as well, and then it continues to spread into Scotland, getting into eastern England by lunchtime. The heaviest rain, though, in the west, over the hills in particular, that rain could cause some problems on its own, and then the winds continue to strengthen through the day. It will will actually be a mild day, but it won't feel all that mild as those winds continue to pick up. So a storm jostling moves in. This is through Tuesday evening into Wednesday morning. We have warnings in place. The strongest winds across the northern half of the country. The rain, as I said, could also cause some issues. We have an amber warning covering northern and western parts of Scotland for gusts maybe up to 80 miles an hour and a broader yellow warning. Some disruption is possible from storm jostling. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. 
I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 4pm. Welcome to the Martin Dormy Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, more immigration madness as it's been revealed that the government intends to shell out a staggering 36 million quid on private boats to pick up channel migrants. Meanwhile, the Rwanda deportation plan comes under scrutiny in the House of Lords. That debate kicked off about half an hour ago. Will the Lords plot to sink it? And Sir Keir Starmer has launched an attack on the Tory party, accusing it of engaging in a culture war when criticising public bodies like the National Trust and the RNLI of wokeism. And a campaign to get children vaccinated against measles has been launched after a rise in the number of cases. So why are cases rising and why are certain parents failing to vaccinate their children? And another royal health scare after the Duchess of York is diagnosed with skin cancer. We'll also have an update on the King's health. And that's all coming up in your next hour. So we're going to have a good ding-dong about immigration after the news. Um, £36 million on boats, the right to work for asylum seekers. I've got an immigration lawyer um, and I've got Lee Anderson next to me ready to kick off. But before that, here's your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you and good afternoon to you. Well, a five-day strike by LNER train drivers next month has been called off. That comes as members of the ASLEF union prepare to launch a series of strikes and an overtime ban from next Monday in their long-running dispute over pay. Drivers were due to walk out from February the 5th amid speculation about new minimum service regulations. Two men have died and tens of thousands of people are still without power after Storm Isha battled, battered the UK last night. A man in his 60s died in a road collision involving two vans and a fallen tree in County Londonderry as Storm Isha caused heavy rain and high winds. And an 84-year-old man died after a car crashed into a fallen tree in Falkirk in Scotland. Storm Isha has wreaked havoc for commuters as well this morning with trains and planes cancelled and now another Another storm, we understand, is on its way. The next storm of the season has been called Storm Jocelyn and she's set to bring strong winds and heavy rain from tomorrow and well into Wednesday with yellow and amber warnings in place across much of the UK. Now, Downing Street has denied that the government's pursuing an agenda against the BBC after announcing a raft of reforms as part of a review into the corporation. Under new plans, Ofcom could gain more powers over BBC News website articles 
as it doesn't meet relevant broadcast standards. Currently, the watchdog is only able to issue an opinion on the matter, but government recommendations say it'll be given increased oversight over the BBC's online public services, including its news site and YouTube channel. The Prime Minister's spokesman says the proposed measures were rightly about ensuring the BBC is able to continue to thrive long into the future. Rishi Sunak said the BBC is not immune to scrutiny. Impartiality is an important tenet of our media industry and that's why you know, I think all, all elements of the media industry have to be subject to the same impartiality rules. I think it's what people would expect and that's what makes our media institutions so great. I mean, we have a free and fair press and impartiality is at the heart of what makes the BBC a strong institution. Now a 13-year-old boy who died after he was deliberately pushed into a river we're told was part of a prank. It comes after 19-year-old Jaden Pugh insisted he slipped into Christopher Capessa, causing him to fall into the river in Wales in July 2019. South Wales Central Coroner's Court heard there was a dispute over whether he'd been pushed into the water from a ledge. Christopher's been described by his family as loving and caring. Ofsted school inspections are resuming in England after pausing to ensure inspectors were given mental health training. Ofsted's new boss delayed inspections at the start of term following the inquest into the suicide of Ruth Perry. She took her own life in January last year after her school was downgraded from outstanding to inadequate. New Ofsted guidance will allow school visits to be paused if staff show signs of distress. British farmers are calling on MPs to support tougher regulations to protect them from what they're calling unfair treatment by the so-called Big Six supermarkets. A dozen scarecrows have been placed outside Parliament today as MPs are going to debate reforms into the grocery supply chain. That's after 110,000 people signed a petition urging the government to overhaul the Grocery Supplies Code of Practice. Riverford Organic, the company which started the petition, say the scarecrows represent farmers who claim they could go out of business in the next 12 months, blaming supermarkets' buying practices. Royal News and the Duchess of York says she is in shock, but she's still in good spirits after being diagnosed with skin cancer. Sarah Ferguson says she's taking some time to herself after having several moles moved, uh, with one of them being identified as cancerous. It's just months after undergoing treatment for breast cancer as well. She's thanked well-wishers and medical staff for all the support she's been given so far. And Queen Camilla has been touring a domestic violence refuge to celebrate the service's 50th anniversary. Her Majesty met staff, volunteers and families at Swindon Domestic Abuse Support Service. During her visit, Queen Camilla told a will-wisher the king is fine as he prepares to undergo treatment for an enlarged prostate this week. The 75-year-old monarch says he is keen to go public with his condition to encourage other men to get themselves checked out. That's the news on GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker. This is Britain's News Channel. Thank you, Polly. Now, loads to get through this hour. A busy, busy show ahead. I'm going to kick off with illegal migration, which has come in the spotlight once again today because the Rwanda deportation plan is under scrutiny in the House of Lords this afternoon as we speak. Meanwhile, it's been revealed that the Home Office spends around 36 million quid on private boats to help the border force pick up migrants in the channel. The vessels are being used on a temporary basis because of a two-year delay in its plans to replace the UK's current fleet of border force cutters. We've also learned that nearly 16,000 asylum seekers, including those who cross the channel in small boats illegally, have been allowed to work in a single year. They've been working in occupations in which there are recognised staff shortages and are paid 80% of the going rate. Even The Guardian are annoyed about this one. Now, joining me in the studio to discuss this is our political correspondent, Catherine Forster. Let's start with the Lords. Once again, the Lords are a-leaping, this time... On to Rishi Sunak for Rwanda build, Lord Ash Goldsmith, Tony Blair's former Attorney General, leading a revolt, and he wants to bog down Rwanda in all sorts of treacle. Well, the bill 
that caused so much uh, attention last week in the Commons is going to come to the Lords next Monday. So that hasn't even started. That's mm -hmm. going to go back and forth. They're going to amend that very, very heavily. But today they are talking about the treaty that they need to ratify. Now, that was agreed in December following the Supreme Court's ruling, along with Kigali. And basically, um, they started in the Lords talking about this about 20 minutes ago. What Lord Goldsmith is saying that they want to see a whole list of safeguards and that they want to know that they are already in place before they will ratify this bill. Now, what they're saying is that some of the elements that have been promised are not implemented yet, and because they're not implemented, they can't ratify it. So they're basically saying you need to, you need to get all of these things in place and at that point we will ratify it. That's what they're wanting. Mm. OK, um, lots to get your head around there, but basically they're trying to derail it. I'm joined also in the studio by Lee Anderson, of course, MP for Ashfield, and Ivan Sampson, an immigration lawyer. Let's start with you, Lee. Um, a lot of criticism, once again, of the Conservatives today. Let's start with this notion of the Lords. The Lords are weaponising, once again, Lord Goldsmith, Labour, teaming up with some Liberal Democrats, and it has to be said in today's press, some One Nation Conservatives yeah. trying, to, trying to derail Rwanda, just like they did Brexit. Yeah, you know, we don't have a majority in the House of Lords, Martin, and uh, we have to remember that the House of Lords are uh, unelected. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if they were elected in places like Ashfield, they'd be saying something slightly different today. Yeah. Uh, look, they've got a job to do. Their job is to scrutinise legislation, try and amend it where possible. But at the end of the day, you know, it's up to Parliament to make that decision. I hope when it does... Come, it's funny that we're talking about this now, actually, yeah. because last week all the talk was about scrapping the bill, and now yeah. the same sort of people are talking about, Lords, leave us alone, let's get the bill through. So uh, let's hope they don't mess about with it too much over the next few weeks. Uh, I suspect they probably will. A lot of do-gooders in there. I noticed the church we're piping on this morning. And I will say... Uh, to the church and the Archbishop of Canterbury, why I'm on here, he's got a big place just across the road, Martin. I walk past that every day. I think it's called Lambeth Palace. It's got hundreds of empty rooms. Uh, we're struggling for accommodation at the moment. Put them in there. Yeah, it's a novel solution, Lee. And one I think would find a lot of, uh, curry a lot of favour in GB Newsland at least. Let's talk. Um, about mm. to both of you gentlemen about this story that broke at the weekend, which I know got you going before we came on air. About 16,000 of those who came yeah. to the country, including some illegally, have been granted the right to work in care homes, mm. in agriculture, in construction. It's got a lot and a lot of people very, very angry. A lot of people threatened to tear up the Conservative Party membership over it, Lee. Well, let's, let's, let's just be honest for, for one minute. I mean, I'm not happy about illegal migrants um, working in this country. I think it adds to the poor factor, but this has been around for a while, this this scheme. If, uh, if an illegal migrant or an asylum seeker, should we say, masquerading as asylum seekers, decide to, to make a claim, and if that claim goes over 12 months and it's not their fault, then they can apply for permission to work in, in um, a sector where we've got shortages. So it's nothing no, but it's been blown out in the, in the press this morning and, and, you know, people are very angry about it. I'm not happy about it. I don't think anybody who arrives here illegally should be given permission to work. I think we should be swiftly removed. Ivan Sampson, presumably you disagree with Leanne on that. You think that asylum seekers should have the right to work? Well, the language is important, first of all. Lee said these people are masquerading well, are. as asylum seekers. So they if are. you look at the actual facts and the figures, the majority of people coming across on the boats are granted refugee status. Fact. Why don't they claim refugee status in France? That's, it's a safe country. Uh, that's another issue, but I was no, just, it's not just it's the same issue. Correcting These what you were saying. These people are masquerading as, as asylum seekers. They are not genuine asylum seekers. If you've passed through six safe countries mm. to get to this country, I'm sorry, you are not a genuine asylum seeker. You would stop in the first country of refuge and claim asylum there. Let's right. make the mockery of our well, system, Martin. The Home Office grants them asylum mm. and they apply the Refugee Convention, <laughs> Lee, which is the law. Yeah. Um, Regarding the right to work, many countries do the same. Um, the US, for example, allows refugees to allow from day, work from day one. Why don't they stop in France? Um, I, I can't answer that question. I can only tell I'll you... answer it. It's because they're not genuine asylum seekers. France is not at war. They're not being persecuted in France. France is a safe country. France is a welcoming country. You know, we keep hearing people bleating on that France accept more than, than this country. Why don't they stop in France? With due respect, you're talking nonsense, because the law says they're refugee status. They have, OK, so that's the law. So unless you quote me a law which says they're not, 
then I can answer you. But well, I mean, I'll, I'll cut you something else then. I went to Cali last year and I spoke to the migrants in the camp, the young men from Eritrea, Sudan, and the first thing they said to me was El Dorado. We're going to that country for the money. They weren't fleeing persecution. Oh, I was sure. there. I listened to these people talk to me and the rest of the Home Affairs Select Committee. They were coming for economic reasons, nothing to do with being persecuted in their own country. Uh, that's just bluster and anecdotal. It's not, it's not, I was there. Look, let me tell you about the Refugee Convention. You don't have to claim asylum in the first country. No, I never said you did. No, but you're, you're suggesting why didn't they? Well, no, the Refugee Convention says you don't. What I'm suggesting is that if you're genuinely you fleeing persecution, then you will, st you will stop in the first safe country. You would not risk your life on a small boat, risk death in that channel, the most dangerous shipping lane in the world, if, if, if you were as genuine as arms. You would not do that. Let me give an example of someone who would do that. OK. They've got family here. The biggest pull factor of refugees coming to the UK yeah. is they know people here. That, yeah. that, that is how they're even funded to come here. So family members will send money to those refugees to allow them to come here. So, with due respect, they're not going to claim asylum in Germany or France or Italy or anywhere why? else. Why not? Because they've got family here. Well, if they claim asylum in France, their family can go to them. Yeah. Surely. OK. Um, regarding right to work, let's talk about that. Yes. Um, look, it's always been around. The reason the government didn't allow right to work from day one, because it bolsters your Article 8 claim. Because if you're working, then you have a stronger Article 8 claim on the basis of private life that you're working. And so if the, if the Home Office takes years to decide your claim, you can say, well, actually, I've been working here for many years. I now have a private life in the UK. That's the reason there was a 12-month moratorium. So, so presumably, because of inefficiencies, maybe just the sheer volume of those arriving, there's an inability to process those claims. So once that 12-months mark is over, woof, they're away, they're free Absol to work. Absolutely. And that's a failing of the entire system. It is. And look, on £5.70 a day, which is what refugees get, you don't get a lot for that. So. I think it's right they should be But they have a work. choice whether or not to come to this country. They have a clear choice. They can stop in Spain, France, Belgium, Switzerland, Italy. They can stop in any Lee, of those countries. We have a choice to be members of the Refugee Convention or not. You don't want to be a member. Don't you start Fine. pointing at me. Vote Listen, against these it. These people, Vote they, against they it. come here on their own free will. Okay. They are not genuine asylum seekers. That's Look your view. There. You can see them on the screen view. there. They're Look. not genuine asylum seekers. You don't like They're the refugee economic migrants. You don't like the refugees. I, it's quite clear, and it's clear to me and the viewers, Listen, Fine, vote, listen. vote out of it. To, I live in the real world, and I've worked in the real world, probably unlike you, and I used to work down the pit with the sons and grandsons of genuine displaced people right. who came from places like Latvia and Estonia after the Second World War. These were genuine asylum seekers. They could not go home or they face certain death. These were, the, these were the genuine asylum seekers that this country um, that rescued, basically, after the war, and we welcomed them, and I'm proud that we've done that, so don't talk your nonsense with me. Well, I, I, Ivan, you have a right, right to reply to that and then we'll move on. Yeah. Well, look, um, I don't think Lee's ever actually read an asylum statement. Tell no. me if you have. Yes, I have. Right, OK. Well, it's a while ago. Yeah, look, the law has a set of criteria that the Home Office will apply. And the Home Office are not refugee friends, let me tell you. They look at these applications critically. Yeah. And the majority of those people coming from across the channel are granted refugee status. Yeah, but they're lying on the forms. If you let me they're finish, telling lies on the if forms. you let me finish, they come from countries like Syria, Afghanistan, um, Eritrea, Yemen. These are countries where people are being persecuted and killed on a daily basis, and they're fleeing, coming to a country which is a member of the Refugee Convention. If we don't like it. Let's come out of yeah. it. Let's have that debate. But I tell you what, we'll join Belarus and Russia as those countries not in that convention. But nobody can answer the question, why did they claim asylum in France? Uh, I did answer that question. No, Many didn't. of them have family members here. So that's the biggest draw pack factor. OK, gentlemen, feisty debate. We're going to have to leave it there. Superb. Ivan Sampson and Lee Anderson. Superb. Thank you very much. <laughs> Catherine. That was feisty. Um, and it's, it's certainly something that gets the people going out there. We can argue all we like about the backlog in asylum seeker cases, which allows the grant, grants the right to work, beg your pardon. But isn't that part of the problem? We have this huge backlog, a system that's groaning at the seams, and as a consequence, everybody's being let down. It's a huge part of the problem. And clearly, if you allow these people to work, Yes, it does exacerbate the pull factors. The whole point of the Rwanda policy was when it was originally announced, Priti Patel said, if you come here illegally, you will be put on a one-way ticket to Rwanda. You will not be coming back. Now, clearly, if that had been implemented, the, the flow of people across the channel 
would have dried up pretty quickly, wouldn't it? Now we're in a position that we may or may not send people to Rwanda at some unspecified future date. There may be a number of appeals and the, the deterrent effect drops very significantly. Uh, Mark White, our Home and Security Editor, was in Calais uh, a few weeks ago and he basically said that migrants thought the whole thing was a joke and they just laughed at the notion of it. But in terms of working, sure, it increases the pull factors. But at the same time, it saves us money, doesn't it? Because if they are earning, you mentioned a, a very small amount of money. What I understand is they're getting 80% of the normal rate. Then they are earning money. Then the costs are smaller of support. Lee and Lee is shaking his head. No, the, the costs aren't smaller, Catherine, because it increases the pull factor, and more and more people keep coming across the channel. That increases the cost. It already costs eight million pound a day. It was six million pound a day. So if you've got people working, you say it's saving money. It's not. It's encouraging more migrants to come across the channel and cost the taxpayer millions and millions. Okay, well, of pounds you can't have it both ways. You you complain about them costing the taxpayer money. They want to stand on their own two feet and fend for themselves, and you complain about that. You can't have it both ways. Okay, we have to leave it there, ladies and gentlemen. Catherine Falls, Ivan Sampson, Lee Anderson. Excellent debate, but we've got to crack on, sadly. Mm -hmm. Now, Sakia Stormer is accusing the Tory party of championing woke agendas to save their own skin. In a speech, the Labour leader set out his hopes for a society of service and went on to accuse the Conservative government of waging war against the country's greatest institutions and charities. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now by former Labour MP Simon Danzik. Simon, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. So here we are, Stormers laying into the Tories on woke issues. But these are issues, actually, Simon, which, which do get a lot of people irritated. They do feel that things like the National Trust and the Royal National Lifeboat Institution are having a political agenda. What's your take? Well, it's an interesting speech that Keir Starmer's uh, made today. It's at the Civil Society Summit that's been held in London. And at one point he says, I'm not here to talk about the Tories, and then proceeds to talk at length about the uh, Tories. Uh, and he attacks them uh, for their position in relation to the National Trust and the RNLI. And I think the Conservatives are on to something here. I think he's, they are right to challenge the National Trust on what their agenda has been. And the most worrying issue here, I think, is that Keir Starmer is trying to normalise the woke agenda. He's trying to make it acceptable uh, to have the views uh, in terms of diversity, in terms of LGBTQ, in terms of slavery and colonialism. He's trying to normalise it because the truth is, Keir is... Captain Walk. I mean, that's the reality of it. He takes the knee for Black Lives Matter. Uh, he struggles to define a woman. He's usually on the side of the illegal immigrant rather than the British citizen. Uh, so he's trying to normalise this whole agenda, and I think that's the serious part of this speech that he's made today. And Simon, don't you think in the past, well, and to this day, everything that Conservatives or, or you know, the right are concerned about, oh, that's racist, it was dismissed with a flick of a wrist. And now, if you're concerned about Churchill being called a racist or a review of National Trust pro properties because they're linked to slavery or the Empire or the RNLI, a lot of people told me in person in Dover they are concerned it's being used as a taxi service ashore. If you say this, oh, it's just culture war, uh, don't, be, don't be ridiculous. And this is same issue. It's Stormer trying to dismiss legitimate concerns with a flick of a wrist. It used to be racist. Oh, now it's just culture war. Yeah, and that's what we have to be careful about. I think the good news is that people are challenging this woke agenda. Uh, the National Trust have quite clearly got it wrong in terms of being overly politicised. So most recently, they've been campaigning on net zero. Listen, their job is around heritage, surely. They have five and a half million members who pay for the National Trust to look after our stately homes across the UK. Now, get on with that, With rather than having a net zero policy or trying to influence uh, politics. They, they, they've got it wrong in terms of Winston Churchill. They've got it wrong in terms of slavery and uh, the empire that we should be proud of. We should be celebrating these things. So it's good that people challenge uh, this woke agenda. But trust me, as sure as night follows day, if we have a Labour government with Keir Starmer in Downing Street, he will be promoting that sort of agenda. That is the nature of his politics, his North London Labour elite, and that's, that's a key part of their agenda. It's a concern to me.
OK, it's concerned to many people. Simon Danzig, thank you very much for joining us. Former Labour MP, it's astonishing sometimes, Simon, when I get you on, that you actually were ever a Labour MP with, with opinions like that. We're all sniggering in the studio. You used to sound like, basically, um, Lee Anderson, but with a different rosette. <laughs> Less that. <laughs> Less that. OK, coming up, there's still weather warnings in place after many parts of Britain were battered by a storm. I show we'll get updates from some of the worst hit areas. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, it's 426. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, Storm Aisha has now cleared, but winds close to 100 miles an hour battered the UK as bad weather swept all across Britain. The Met Office has warned of a continuing danger to lies from flying debris, with thousands suffering from power cuts and flooding. Sadly, two deaths have now been confirmed as a result of the storm, and the UK isn't going to get much relief from Storm Aisha. A storm Jocelyn is now forecast to bring strong winds and heavy rain to the UK tomorrow and into Wednesday. Our Home Security Editor, Mark White, has this report. 
On the Isle of Man overnight, images overlooking the seafront showed Storm Isha at her most powerful, whipping up the waves, sending them crashing over a main road. Despite the obvious danger, a local cyclist decided to take a late night bike ride along the seafront. It was Western communities across the UK and Ireland that felt the brunt of Storm Isha first. The boats in this harbour in County Dublin took a real battering from winds gusting close to 100 miles an hour. Within hours, Britain and the Republic's entire coastlines were suffering the effects of this powerful storm. From Cornwall to Brighton to Blackpool and beyond, these coastal communities are well used to winter storms, but Isha certainly packed a punch. It was felt most acutely by those still out at sea. Footage taken from a passenger on board this Stena ferry from Liverpool to Belfast, filmed as the vessel was left circling in the Irish Sea for 11 hours last night before it could safely dock in Belfast at first light this morning. And that disruption to travel has been felt very significantly on land as well. Shots from a filling station in County Meath are more reminiscent of the images during hurricane season in the US. Like here in Belfast, the storm brought down hundreds of trees onto roads and vehicles right across the country, leading to numerous road closures for a time. Across the rail network, temporary 50 mile an hour speed limits were imposed. Part of a garden shed landed by the tracks near Bell Grove Station in Glasgow. In Kent, a whole greenhouse ended up on the tracks near Westgate on Sea. Some of the most dramatic images could be seen at the end of runways across the country as air travel was badly affected. This British Airways flight into Heathrow, one of many forced to abort its landing because of the crosswinds. Oh, she's up, she's down, she's gone. On board, another aborted landing from Munich to Dublin, a taste of the terror and frustration for these passengers. <laughs> this flight from Ibiza to London City was also diverted, but much to the relief of passengers, it managed to land successfully at Gatwick Airport. Hey. <laughs> Mark White, GB News. And well done, that pilot. And joining us now is North West of England reporter Sophie Reaper, who's in Blackpool. Hello, Sophie. Last time we spoke to you, you're clinging on there for dear life. What's the latest? It's essentially still the same, Martin. The sun is starting to set here over Blackpool's promenade, but the wind is blowing just as hard as it has been doing all day here at this seaside town. Uh, people pretty much avoiding the streets. We've barely seen anyone today, uh, as we're definitely still feeling the impacts here of Storm Isha. And there doesn't look to be much respite for the people here in Blackpool or elsewhere in the UK, for that matter, as the Met Office has already named the next storm, Storm Jocelyn, and we're expecting that to touch down on UK soil in a matter of hours, which will continue the widespread impacts all over the nation. We're currently in a state of yellow alert set by the Met Office, which is potential danger to life because of flying debris, uh, potential for power cuts, potential, not potential, there have been major travel disruptions all over the UK over the past 24 hours. Uh, so it's something now we're expecting to continue for the coming days as Storm Jocelyn is, is set to take over. OK, Sophie Reaper, thanks for that in Blackpool. Stay safe and indeed everybody else out there too.
There's lots more to come between now and five o'clock, including plans in Birmingham to get rid of thousands of car parking spaces to reduce the number of private petrol and diesel cars driving into the city. Once again, it's a war on the motorist. But first is your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. top stories this hour. Two men have died and tens of thousands of people are still without power after storm Isha battered the UK. Strong winds brought down trees and wreaked havoc, forcing the cancellation of trains and planes. And now another weather system is on its way. Storm Jocelyn is set to hit the country tomorrow and Wednesday with yellow and amber warnings being issued for much of the country. A five-day strike by LNER train drivers next month has been called off. It comes as members of the ASLEF union prepare to launch a series of walkouts as well as an overtime ban from next Monday in a long-running dispute over pay. LNER drivers were due to walk out from the 5th of February over speculation about new minimum service levels. And Downing Street has denied the government's pursuing an agenda against the, the BBC after announcing a raft of reforms as part of a review into the corporation. Under the new plans, Ofcom could gain more powers over BBC News website articles if it doesn't meet relevant broadcast standards. Currently, the watchdog's only able to issue an opinion on the matter, but government recommendations say it'll be given increased oversight over the BBC's online public services. And the Queen has toured a domestic violence refuge to celebrate 50 years of protecting women. Camilla met staff, volunteers and families at the Swindon Domestic Abuse Centre. During her visit, she told a well-wisher that the King was fine as he prepared this week to undergo treatment for an enlarged prostate. King Charles has said he's keen to go public with his condition to encourage other men to get themselves checked out. Those are the top stories. More background on all of them by heading to our website gbnews.com Thank you, Polly. Now, Birmingham plans to get rid of thousands of car parking spaces to reduce the number of private petrol and diesel cars that are allowed to drive into the city. And the move is part of Birmingham City Council's new transport plan, which details parking changes which will affect residents and tourists. Parking updates will be used to manage demand for car travel across the city. Well, join me now is Howard Cox, the founder of Fair Fuel UK. Howard, Welcome to the show. Another day, another war on the motorists. Does it sometimes feel to you, Howard, that councils across Britain just simply hate car drivers? Well, I couldn't put it any better. It's simple as that. I've gone past being angry. I've just got, I feel saddened for these tin pot councillors who have nothing better to do but just, oh, what more can we do to hurt the drivers? The worst thing about this, it's going to hit the economy of Birmingham. You know, the high street's going to suffer from people not driving into a park to go and shop, to go to the restaurants, go to theatres, and that sort of thing. It impacts on small businesses, who you know, small uh, sole traders who use uh, small cars and vans to go and do work in the city, etc. It is absolutely crass stupidity. And why they're doing it, I don't know, but they certainly didn't ask any of the voters uh, or the people of, of Birmingham. Uh, there was no public consultation. It's just been based on this idea that the motorist is a bad thing and that everything to do with the green economy is a good thing. Well, Howard, I'd like to hazard a guess as to why they're doing it, because the devil is in the detail, as usual, and they say here they're going to sell off car parks to developers for more productive use. Now, bear in mind, Howard, that Birmingham City Council has re recently declared itself bankrupt. Are they basically selling off car parks to cover up their own debt? And what will happen then is that either motorists can't get into Birmingham or they'll get tickets if they try. Well, you, you, you beat me to my next point. I was going to say exactly that. Marty, you got it spot on as ever. Um, and don't forget, this, this, it's a, they've got a Tory mayor. mayor. That, you mm. can't believe this. This is a Conservative administration. You can't blame it on Labour, even though one of the Labour councillors behind it, the transport spokesman for it, uh, they are the ones actually driving this. And sorry to use the pun. Uh, uh, the, the simple thing is, no one was asked. It's totally undemocratic. What is going on with this thing? And I repeat, it will ruin the economy of Birmingham. I just don't get it. 
And Howard, Birmingham also has a clean air zone, a kind of mini Oulaz. It's only eight, a mere eight quid a day to drive in Birmingham now if you had to have a non-compliant car, as opposed to 15, wherever it is, in London. But a staggering um, piece of data that came to light here, Howard, the council in Birmingham has lost 2,500 car parking spaces every year since 2012. This is a long-term downward trend, and you can only conclude that they simply want cars off the road. But what are people meant to do to get about? Well, this is the point. It is. This is the uh, the whole country is doing it, and the government are not stopping these local authorities doing it. Particularly, as you well know, in London, what we're seeing uh, at the moment is the driver is being picked on. If you've drive, ninety five percent of drivers, thirty seven million of us, drive a diesel or a petrol vehicle, and I'm afraid it's not going to change. The electric vehicle is not going to take over from it. But you know, but, you know, one of the things that people are brought up to me regularly is the fact that electric vehicles are heavier. They're going to cause more damage to car parks mm. and that sort of thing. And, they, and in Germany, for example, electric vehicles aren't actually uh, stored in, in, in car parks because the danger of them, them, it's very difficult to put out fires. They seem to be happening with more regularity. Martin, the simple fact is this is a war on the motorist. And, that, and we mustn't understate that phrase. I'm using it all the time and I'm going to be fighting like mad till I die. <laughs> OK, Howard Cox, I know you will found a fair few UK, also the Reform Party candidate for the London mayoralty, which is next this May, next May. Now, coming up, I'm taking talking tax cuts as the Prime Minister reassures the public it's cuts with him and rises with Starmer. Do we believe him? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. 
I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, it's 4.42. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. It's tax cuts with me or tax risers with Keir Starmer, says, says Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, as he starts drawing up his next budget in March. Amidst rumours of plans to slash income tax and national insurance, Sunak says the economy is beginning to turn a corner. But is that true? Well, joining me now is the man who knows the answer to that. It's Liam Halligan, GB News' economics and business editor with On The Money. So, an election's coming up, Liam. Really? And once again, <laughs> it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> but seriously, it's tax cuts or die, surely, for Rishi. Look, the Tories are trying desperately to get a narrative running that the economy's improving, mm. there's more money in your pocket, mm. inflation's coming down, interest rates are coming down, retail sales are going up, there's a feel-good factor coming. It's round the corner. Here it comes, which is why they want to have an election in sort of September, October, November, yeah. rather than April or May. They're desperately trying to get attention away from the, the mess, almost said a rude word there, in the House of Commons, <laughs> as Rishi Sunak tries to tackle this small boat problem with a lot of opposition, of course, coming from within his own party. Yeah. So we had Rachel Reeves, the shadow chancellor at the sort of swanky gab fest in uh, sweet Switzerland, Davos saying that Labour's now the party of low taxation. We want to celebrate success. We want to cut the top rate of tax, says Labour. Crikey, when Liz Truss said that, mm. everybody thought she was mad, didn't they? Mm. But that's because there's an election coming, so people get a little bit a little bit economical with the actualité, as uh, the great political diarist Alan Clark once said. So, look, Rishi Sunak has tried to grab the narrative. He's written an article in The Sun, uh, and this is what he said about tax. I've been working flat out to get the economy back on track, says the Prime Minister, by halving inflation, reducing debt and boosting growth. Where we can, we will always prioritise tax cuts to put more of people's money in their pockets. But, of course, Rishi Sunak as Chancellor and Jeremy Hunt now as Chancellor, they've presided over tax rises, mm. not least those stealth taxes, freezing the thresholds where tax starts at the basic rate, the upper rates, the top rates, so more and more people get dragged into those tax brackets. Taxation, Martin, the so-called tax burden, mm. the share of the economy taken by tax, is at a 70-year high. Crikey, and this is a Conservative government. And that's why Labour are coming back saying, no, 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 you're not the low-tax party, we're the low-tax party. Here we have Darren Jones, he's a shadow Treasury Minister, mm -hmm. he's one of Rachel Reeves' uh, juniors, we're going to be hearing a lot more from him. Here he, here he is. This Tory government is the highest taxing government of all time in this country. That's not quite true, um, but it, you, it is on some definitions, I guess. And no amount of double speak will make people forget that. The Tories have failed. Look, in the end, UK elections, as you know well, Martin, yep. you've been a politician yourself, an elected politician, they're one in the centre ground. You've got about a third of people on, on the right, you've got about a third of people on the left, yep. then you've got a third of people in the middle, the so-called swing voters, and they're going to w vote on what we call pocketbook and wallet issues. Am I going to be better off? Is my family going to be better off? Mm. And that comes down to tax. Yes, immigration is important in this election. Yes, issues to do with Europe and Brexit may still be important. All kinds of other issues. But it's always about the economy, stupid, as yep. you said, and that's about tax. The big question is, though, the biscuit tin is completely empty. Uh. 2.6 trillion in debt, which makes small beer of that Liam Byrne, there's no money left note. How can they afford tax cuts? There is a lot of debt, but if you can get great both going, then you generate more tax revenue, there's more activity, and the budget deficit starts to fall, and then you can maybe afford tax cuts. That's certainly what Jeremy Hunt is hoping. He's got a budget on March the 6th. He's looking for what they, they call that fiscal headroom. There'll be lots of arm-twisting going on 
with the Office for Budget Responsibility, the kind of in-the-dark um, civil servants, as it were, who basically say if the government's got the fiscal room for manoeuvre to do what it wants to do in terms of both spending and lower taxes, there is objectively signs of a bit more fiscal headroom now. But crikey, the Tories have got a long way to go because a lot of people are really upset by those stealth taxes. Sunak is now determining which kind of taxes they want to cut. For a long time, the Tories have been saying they want to cut inheritance tax. I personally think that's nuts yeah. because that only really applies to relatively well-off families. I think they should be cutting what we call the starting rate of income tax, raising the personal allowance to take people, it's currently 12 and a half grand, all the way up to £20,000. So if you earn less than £20,000 a year, the average wage is about £32,000, then you don't actually pay any income tax. Of course, you're still paying VAT, still paying council tax, lots of other taxes. I've been arguing that in my Telegraph column for months and months and months. It seems Downing Street, with this article from Sunak, is now coming round to that point of view, because Sunak is talking about cutting personal taxes, cutting national insurance a bit more. Mm. I, would, I wouldn't do the top rate of tax, though. Again, it's mm. a small number of people. I would start with the basic rate of income tax, the personal allowance, so as many people have, have put as possible benefit. If you if you look at those, if you look if you raise the top rate, the, the basic rate starting allowance uh, to twenty thousand pounds, you take three or four million people out of tax, including a lot of people who who get the basic state pension, of course, on which we are taxed. Superb. Okay, Liam Halligan, it's almost like Rishi Sunak reads your telegraph column. Always <laughs> a pleasure. Good lad. <laughs> That's been said. <laughs> okay, moving on. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis this will no longer be challenging Donald Trump in the race to be the Republican presidential candidate in the 2024 election. We can't ask our supporters to volunteer their time and donate their resources if we don't have a clear path to victory. Accordingly, I am today suspending my campaign. Well, President Trump welcomed the news, saying he was honoured by Ron DeSantis' endorsement and was later caught on camera saying he would no longer be mocking him with his nickname. He just said, will I be using the name Ron DeSanctimonious? I said, that name is officially retired. <laughs> well, there we go. Ron DeSanctimonious officially retired. Our reporter, Ray Addison, joins us now. Ray, always a pleasure. So it seems DeSantis realised that nobody, certainly not him, can stop the Trump train he threw in the towel. Well, yeah, he's had a really tough year in terms of campaigning for the presidency. He was just about 10 points below Trump in January of 2023. Uh, but this most recent poll uh, for New Hampshire had him at just 6%. Uh, and that's a terrible figure, especially considering he's been spending so much money all across the US to try to raise his profile. We know as well that although he came second in Iowa, he spent £200 million in order to achieve that and he just still didn't get the kind of figures that he needed. Uh, Trump well ahead of him in the polls. And do you think, as usual, Ray, the, um, I mean, he realises that he can't win, but would he be fishing for a job in the Trump camp, do you think? Hopes to be a part of the fabric? Well, it's really interesting. I mean, you saw there with the tone of, of Donald Trump, he says he's retiring that nickname, uh, Ron de Sanctimonious. I'm sure he'll be delighted by that. And he was uh, at a, a campaign rally last night. Donald Trump was uh, saying he's, you know, he's a very capable man and he's run a really good campaign. So the tone has completely changed. And, of course, you know, he was a real supporter of uh, Ron DeSantis, particularly when he wanted to become uh, governor of Florida. And so, who knows? It's entirely possible now that with his support. You know, a year's or, or 11 months is a long time in politics, and it's very, very possible that he could uh, get a role in the Trump administration if he behaves himself. And um, Ray, Nikki Haley, who's the last woman standing, the last candidate standing, really, uh, she said all the fellas have left now. She will relish going head-to-head -head with the Don, but also let's talk that she'd be eyeing up a role potentially as vice president. It seems, Ray, the narrative now is let's stay in the race for as long as we can, but really we just can't beat Donald Trump. Well, she's knocked 14 men out of this race. She's the last uh, one standing, apart from 
Donald Trump, and I think she actually believes that she's got a real chance of winning. It really depends now what happens tomorrow in New Hampshire. Of course, we know that around 30% of Ron DeSantis's supporters say that if he's not running, then they will vote for Nikki Haley, so that's good for her numbers. However, 62% said that they would back Trump, so even better news for Donald Trump. So it, let's see what happens tomorrow. I mean, it's possible that if she has a terrible day uh, in New Hampshire, we could have a resignation within a matter of days. If she does very strongly, then the next state is South Carolina, which is her home state, and uh, anything is possible. She's expected to win that. If she gets some real momentum going, it's possible that we could see a very good run. And, Ray, um, the liberal media will be clutching its pearls in horror. They thought this guy was gone, like the Terminator, but his eyes are glowing red and he's back. It's looking very much like it's going to be Trump versus Biden again. And the policies that Trump's been coming out with, very populist, proven to be very popular, Ray. Well, I mentioned, didn't I, that uh, Ron DeSantis was only 10 points behind Donald Trump back in January 2023. The reason why uh, Trump suddenly took off is after those indictments. All of those criminal indictments came out, and Donald Trump's polling numbers really took off. I think people uh, feel that there... And this is obviously the narrative that Donald Trump is pushing, that there is some kind of attempt by the so-called deep state, the Department of Justice, the, the Democratic Party and other government institutions to try and have a coordinated attack on Donald Trump. And I think that his supporters, this MAGA movement, America First, they've really embraced that and it's motivated them not only to come out and vote for Trump when necessary, but to support him and to, as he says, get all your friends, your family out to come and vote for me too. And so, you know, he, he really does have a lot of momentum at the moment. OK, Ray Addison, thank you for that update on the political situation in America. That's November the 5th. It's going to be one hell of a fireworks show, isn't it? Now, lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on Rwanda. Richard says this. Thank God there's someone who's got the guts to stand up and tell the truth. I 100% agreed with everything Lee Anderson says. We need more people like Lee before the country goes to rack and ruin. Of course, Lee was sat right here having a good old ding-dong with immigration lawyer Ivan Sampson talking common sense. Adrian says this. Lee Anderson, who shouted on about amending the Rwanda bill and then abstained, needs to keep quiet. He should have backed the Prime Minister and on Birmingham Council very quickly. Brian says, Birmingham City Council are not interested in motorists, taxpayers or common sense. Motorists are simply a cash, cash cow for local and central government failures alike. OK, now we've got loads more coming in the next hour, including that Lord's debate, including Starmer saying that we're all gone woke. We'll be arguing about all of that. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Don't go anywhere. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Afternoon, I'm Alex Deakin. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Storm Isha is out of the way, but Storm Jocelyn is on the way for later tomorrow. The strongest winds across the northern half of the UK. There is Isha exiting up towards Norway, but Jocelyn is brewing out in the Atlantic. We're between these two storm systems at the moment. Still quite windy out there this evening. Plenty of showers being blown in on that brisk wind as well. Some heavy ones continuing over Scotland, but for many places it'll become dry and clear overnight and the winds will continue to ease down a little. That could allow temperatures to get down to freezing in rural parts of Scotland, but for most of us we'll stay a little above freezing at three or four Celsius. Here comes the next area of rain though, a wet start for Northern Ireland. That rain will spread into Wales and southwest England before dawn as well and then it continues to spread into Scotland getting into eastern England by lunchtime. The heaviest rain though in the west over the hills in particular, that rain could cause some problems on its own and then the winds continue to strengthen through the day. It will actually be a mild day but it won't feel all that mild as those winds continue to pick up. So a storm jostling moves in. This is through Tuesday evening into Wednesday morning. We have warnings in place. The strongest winds across the northern half of the country. The rain, as I said, could also cause some issues. We have an amber warning covering northern and western parts of Scotland for gusts maybe up to 80 miles an hour and a broader yellow warning. Some disruption is possible from storm jostling. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News.
Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. And good afternoon, it's 5pm. Welcome to the Martin Dorby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, more immigration madness has been revealed that the government intends to shell out a staggering 36 million quid on private boats to pick up channel migrants. Meanwhile, the Rwanda deportation plan is currently under scrutiny in the House of Lords as we speak. Will they plot to sink it like they did with Brexit? And two people have now died and thousands are still without power following the devastation caused by Storm Isha. Many parts of the UK remain under a severe weather warning and we'll have updates from all of the worst affected areas. And the BBC faces tougher scrutiny over alleged bias and this comes after complaints against the corporation rose last year by a staggering 50%. I'm asking, is the BBC fit for purpose? And the campaign to get children vaccinated against measles has been launched after a rise in the number of cases. So why do so many parents fail to vaccinate their children? That's all coming up in your next hour.
So thanks for joining me this afternoon. As usual, I want to hear from you. Email me your views, gbviews at gbnews.com. All the latest coming up. But first of all, is your news with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you. Well, the news this hour is that two men have died and tens of thousands of people are still without power after Storm Isha battered the UK last night. A man in his 60s died in a road collision in County Londonderry and an 84-year-old man died after a car crashed into a fallen tree in Falkirk in Scotland. The strong winds and heavy rain have also caused travel disruption and left homes without electricity. And the next storm of the season has been named as, and is on its way Storm Jocelyn is set to hit the UK tomorrow with yellow and amber warnings in place for much of the UK. A five-day strike by LNER train drivers next month, though, has been called off. It comes as members of the ASLEF union prepare to launch a series of strikes and an overtime ban from next Monday in their long-running dispute over pay. LNER drivers were due to walk out from February the 5th amid speculation about new minimum service levels. Downing Street has denied that the government is pursuing an anti-BBC agenda after it announced a raft of reforms as part of a review into the corporation. Under new plans, Ofcom could gain more powers over BBC News website articles if it doesn't meet relevant broadcast standards. Government recommendations say Ofcom will be given increased oversight over the BBC's online public services. Rishi Sunak says BBC News is not immune to scrutiny. Impartiality is an important tenet of our media industry and that's why you know, I think all, all elements of the media industry have to be subject to the same impartiality rules. I think it's what people would expect and that's what makes our media institutions so great. I mean, we have a free and fair press and impartiality is at the heart of what makes the BBC a strong institution. Rishi Sunak. Now, a prank meant that a 13-year-old boy died after he was deliberately pushed into a river in South Wales, a coroner's court has heard. Christopher Capessa was pushed by Jaden Pugh, who'd previously said his friend had slipped in July of 2019. The court in Pontypridd heard there was also a dispute over whether Christopher had been pushed into the water from a ledge. The Capessa family said Christopher had been a loving and caring boy. Ofsted school inspections are resuming in England after they were paused to make sure inspectors have the relevant mental health training. It's after the inquest into the death of Ruth Perry, who took her own life after her school was downgraded from outstanding to inadequate. Ofsted's new boss had delayed inspections till the start of the spring term. New Ofsted guidance will allow school visits to be paused if staff show signs of distress. British farmers are calling on MPs to support tougher regulations to protect them from what they're calling unfair treatment by the so-called Big Six supermarkets. A dozen scarecrows have been placed outside Parliament today as MPs are going to be debating reforms to the grocery supply chain. That's after 110,000 people signed a petition urging the government to overhaul the grocery supply chain's code of practice. Riverford Organic, the company which started the petition, say the scarecrows represent farmers who claim they could go out of business in the next 12 months, blaming supermarkets buying practices. Royal News and the Duchess of York says she's in shock but in good spirits after being diagnosed with skin cancer. Sarah Ferguson says she's taking some time to herself after having several moles removed, with one being identified as cancerous. It's just months after she had treatment for breast cancer. She's thanked well-wishers and medical staff for the support she's been given so far. And Queen Camilla has been touring a domestic refuge in domestic violence refuge rather in Swindon to celebrate the service's 50th anniversary there. Her Majesty met with staff, volunteers and families at the Swindon Domestic Abuse Support Service. During her visit, Queen Camilla told a well-wisher that the King was fine as he prepares to undergo treatment for an enlarged prostate this week. The 75-year-old monarch says he's keen to go public with his condition to encourage other men to get themselves checked out. That's the news on GB News, across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker. This is Britain's News Channel.
Thank you, Polly. Now, loads to get through this hour. A busy, busy show ahead and indeed a week in politics. Illegal migration has come to the spotlight once again today. The Rwanda deportation plan is under scrutiny as we speak in the House of Lords this afternoon. Meanwhile, it's been revealed that the Home Office is spending an eye-watering 36 million quid on private boats to help the border force pick up migrants in the Channel. The vessels are being used on a temporary basis because of a two-year delay in its plans to replace the UK's current fleet of border force cutters. And we've also learned that nearly 16,000 asylum seekers, including those who cross the channel in small boats illegally, have been allowed to work in a single year last year. And they've been working in occupations in which there are recognised staff shortages and are paid 80% of the going rate. And even The Guardian are angry about that, calling it slave labour. Well, let's speak now to our political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris, let's start with the laws. That debate, lengthy debate, starting today in earnest. A lot of talk. Um, it's being led by Lord Goldsmith, yep. um, Labour, um, Blair's former Attorney General, teaming up with the Lib Dems in what some people are saying an unholy alliance to try and derail Rwanda like they tried to derail Brexit. This won't succeed, though. I think this is a, they're looking at a, a, a report from the International Agreements Committee. Uh, they're looking it's they're trying to say that the UK can't um, uh, um, ensure this treaty applies until it's safe in Rwanda, and that that will put a delay on any any planes taking off. But Number Ten has been pretty clear that if that happened, they, if if this this amendment's passed, this this uh, motion's passed today, they'll simply lay a written a written ministerial statement saying Rwanda is safe, and that's the end of that. This is almost the hors d'oeuvre before the kind of East mm -hmm. coming up in terms of the Rwanda plan when it's when it's really looked at hard by the peers and that mm -hmm. starts in, uh, early next month and then you want to see amendments and it might come back a shadow of its former self mm -hmm. uh, from the document which left the House of Commons last week and then it's people like Ben and others will try and reinstate mm -hmm. and try and make this document as hard as it was last week. Yeah, I'm also joined in the studio by Ben Bradley, MP Conservative for Mansfield. Before I come to you, Ben, a quick little nibble at this 16,000 people allowed to work, some of whom came here yeah. illegally over the channel. It's got a lot of people very, very hot under the collar over the weekend. Some Conservative members saying they're going to rip up their membership. This is the final insult, they're saying. Well, particularly those on the Tory right, because it's, almost, it's all about pull factors, uh, migration policy. If you have a reason to come to risk your, risk your life, risk your life, let's say again, to come across the, across the English Channel, what are you going to? Well, come Currently, you're going to stay in a hotel and get a job paying 80% what you will be in the actual economy. So it, it's a further reason to, to cross, cross the channel, and that's the problem. The government's trying to find ways to stop, to break the business model, stop people coming ac across the, the channel. One idea <coughs> is this Rwanda plan, to deport them to Rwanda when they get, get here. But um, as, if you do that alongside giving them work, and put them up in hotels, it's very hard to, to make, make that make any mm. sense. Ben Bradley, I'd like to pop to you now. First, first brick in the blue wall, Mansfield, you, you, were, you were there and you campaigned on Brexit and we all lived through those times where we saw the laws do their damnness to try and derail it. Are you getting echoes of history repeating itself about the Rwanda bill? Well, I certainly think they'll give it a go. Um, I don't think it will work. And uh, the nature of the Lords is that they can try and delay and, and make a mess of it. But ultimately, it's the Commons that decides. Um, I have no doubt they will put in lots of amendments to try and weaken it, to try and bin it. Uh, but ultimately, th th it passed quite strongly in the Commons in the end. Question. Last week. And when it comes back, asking what uh, evidence no there is will continue to. Effect. Yeah, we're being heckled by a Lord live on air. It's almost <laughs> like they knew you were here, Ben. Uh, these are live pictures from the House of Lords. That's why. So as you can see, they're staying awake and they are debating this topic as we speak. Um, Chris, this is expected to go on until what, March or the next century? No, no, no. <laughs> and they're they're going to try to go for improved complaints processes, training for Rwandan officials, a new yeah. asylum law guaranteeing people will not be returned to countries where they could be in danger. Weigh it down with conditions right. to stop flights taking off. That's what's happening here. Yeah. Um, and this is the beginning of, of a lot of focus on the red benches, not the green benches. But number 10 was clear the afternoon briefing I went to just now. It, these flights will take off in the spring. <laughs> when is the spring? They won't say. Would, would that go as long as the June summer solstice? They wouldn't say that that's either. But they are intent on making this happen. Even if a few hundred take off, that'd be a victory for, for Mr. Sinek at this stage. Fundamentally, I think the okay. thing that's important is the Commons are in charge in this relationship, yeah. right? And they, if they 
Mu muddy it up. If they make it um, not worth the paper it's written on, the Commons can reverse that. Yeah, I want to talk to you about this 36 million quid that's been found to help border force. Um, an astonishing situation that a lot of people saying we're meant to be stopping the boats, but mm. no, we're putting 36 million quid's worth of new boats in there and they won't return. Yeah. They'll help the people from France to come ashore into Britain. Well, Chris is right that all of this has got to be about deterrence. You can't have pull factors. You've got to have reasons why it's not worth coming. And that's what the whole Rwanda plan uh, is about, mm. that if you arrive here, you won't be allowed to stay anywhere. You'll be put straight on a plane to somewhere else, uh, and that will prevent, A, us having to do this in the channel, and B, prevent the other thing you were talking about, of people being here so long that they end up qualifying to get yeah. work, because they won't be here in the first place. And that's fundamentally what we need to do. It's part of a wider um, range of measures. We just need to get it done, we need to get it passed, and we need to get these flights off. So, it, go on. Well, did you think that the part of the problem with the UK, if it is a problem, is that we don't have ID cards here? Mm. Is that where it's going? Do you think if you, if we all had to carry around some form of ID in our pockets, it'd be much mm. harder to discipline the black economy for, the, for people arriving here illegally? Well, look, there's a balance to all these things, aren't there? And we have this debate quite live at the minute. I've heard it on this show about ID cards, about things like um, uh, your online currency and all the rest of it. Those things are easier to track and easier, therefore, to prevent these things. There are also other implications to that as well, right, that a lot of people Some don't like. So, um, so it is a balance, you know. Now, I want to talk about councils. You run Nottinghamshire Council, not Nottingham City Council. Council, which, of course, distinction. which of course a lot of people are getting on to you about, mistakenly thinking that you were part of Nottingham City Council, that's where I was born, Nottingham City Council, um, what's the polite way of putting it, they've gone, what's it's up? Financially, they went bust, and that was over the Robin Hood energy mm -hmm. scheme. Today, we're seeing Birmingham Council ripping out car parks to sell off land because they're also going bust. What is it? about these councils that's failing. You run a council that's doing well. Well, all councils are under pressure, including my own. Ours is relatively in a reasonable place. I would say good leadership and management, right? But um, the ones who have gone bust have cocked something up somewhere in the system. For Nottingham, that was Robin and Energy and a range of other things. For Birmingham, it was a big argument about equal pay and yep. what they failed to do around their, their HR arrangements. They're making a mess. And then they get pulled back to, you can only deliver statutory requirements, which means all the other stuff, the nice to have stuff is slashed. And that's awful for residents. Yeah. Um, that's why I've written to government this week, not to protect councils like that, but where good, well-managed councils um, are coming under pressure now from rising costs to say we need a bit of help from government actually in the sector to make sure we can continue to deliver important services. OK, Ben, can you stick with us? I want to get your take on Sir Keir Starmer. That's my next story here. Sir Keir Starmer is accusing the Tory party of championing woke agendas to save their own skin. In a speech, the Labour leader set out his hopes for a society of service, as he calls it, and went on to accuse the Conservative government of waging war against the country's greatest institutions and charities. Well, I'm joined now by the political commentator Matthew Stadler. Matthew, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. Do you think? Do you think? Do you think that um, that Stormer has a point? He's saying here ostensibly that the Conservative Party whips up this so-called culture war every time he think that he thinks that they're losing to gain traction. I've almost no doubt at all that he's absolutely spot on. The Conservatives have been waging these exhausting culture wars that divide us as a society, that turn us against each other. And to my mind, the obvious reason for them having done that over the last few years is to distract from the cost of living crisis, which is still gripping so many of us. I mean, have you tried getting your car insured recently? It's, it's extraordinarily expensive. In my experience, if you've been down to the shops to, to get your groceries, things are still really, really pricey. So that's going on. Our NHS is crippled by massive, massive waiting lists. There's concern about immigration, although you could argue that's part of the culture wars. What Starmer is saying is, let's live in a civil society together. Let's live in a positive society, in a society of service. It almost harks back, actually, to David Cameron's idea of the big society, but the Labour leader is saying the big society became the poor society under, under Cameron's coalition government because of those years of austerity. What he wants is for us to come together, stop tearing ourselves to pieces, and for goodness sake, for government, for ministers, for MPs, to stop kicking great British institutions like the National Trust and through their rhetoric on the small boats, having a go at the, the Royal British Lifeboat Institution, which is a fantastic national institution, helps to save lives. Let's come together instead of tearing ourselves apart.
But Matthew, it's a fair point to say that a lot of people, for example, when the, when the National Trust had a review of their links to slavery and the empire, they even called mahogany racist. That affected a lot of people. It annoyed a lot of people. And a lot of people I know when I've been to places like Dover and met the electorate, they do believe, because they see it with their own eyes, that the RNLI is being used to bring migrants ashore. They have a valid concern about these things. And isn't it unfair to just dismiss this as culture wars if it's a Relevant. No, I think the Tories are doing exactly as I've just said. They are trying to distract from years of failure. If you ask any of our viewers today whether they feel they are better off, better off in a small way or a significant way since the Tories first came to, to power after those new Labour years in 2010, I think you really struggle to find many who say, yes, we've had three Conservative Prime Ministers since the last general election, since we last had an opportunity to vote. And instead, we're having rows over these, cu these culture wars. It's absolutely bonkers. As for the RNLI, these people are incredibly brave, Martin. I mean, these people put their own lives on the line day after day. I have nothing but respect for them, whether they're picking up desperate migrants or asylum seekers or they're picking up British citizens. They are saving lives. It's not their fault that people are trying to get to this country. Matthew, um, the, the root of all of this is identity politics, um, by dividing us into groups and pitting us against each other. And that is ostensibly something you have to admit that the Labour Party has majored on for years and years now, certainly since the Miliband era. And so what I put it to you, is that going to get any better? Will these issues, these so-called culture wars, go away if we have a Labour Prime Minister, or will they actually get worse? Well, I would argue that the culture wars are of the Conservatives' making. Let's examine this word woke, because it keeps popping up again and again. It seems to have replaced that old phrase, political correctness. What does it mean to be woke? It just means that you have a concern for social injustice, tick, I'd like us to live in a fairer society, wouldn't you, Martin? And it also means you have a concern about discrimination. Who wants to discriminate against people? If someone is stealing a Rolex, it doesn't matter to me whether they're black, white, purple or blue. Get them in prison. The Met Police very recently did some really valuable work there. Again, very, very brave people, like those lifeboat operators. What are they doing? They're pretending that they're victims, and then they're nabbing these nasty thugs. I'm not interested in the colour of someone's skin. I think what Labour are doing is saying, let's focus on helping each other out, being a decent society, being a properly civil society. And I think it's also a sense in this speech from, Ch from Starmer that there's a role for charity, that that might act as a bridge between the individual and the state. OK, Matthew Sadler, thank you for your input. I'm going to come back to the studio now. Ben Bradley, been very patiently sitting through Matthew there, and you were, you were, you were a couple of sides. It was of... a struggle to sit through, I have to say, all yeah. of that. What, um, what nonsense. I, all of this, all, fundamentally, and you mentioned the identity politics of it all, stems from Labour's Equality Act in uh, 2010, just before the general election, um, that embedded that um, lumping people into boxes into our legislation, never mind our national conversation. And the idea that things like um, racism, immigration, uh, gender, all these things that are really difficult debates are just noise, um, is ridiculous. They are fundamental to our country's culture and what people believe. And Ben, I know some of the work that you've been doing on white working class labs Absolutely. being the, the bottom of education have been for over 20 straight years now. Mm. This kind of conversation actually gets in the way of helping those yeah. people. Yeah, and you know, where we've got real issues, there are inequalities like that. A lot of our national conversation doesn't recognise that because they are white lads and white lads mm. are privileged. Um, and they are really difficult challenges. But in this case, uh, actually, the Conservatives this week are talking about the economy, we're talking about local government finance, we're talking about tackling illegal migration. It's Keir Starmer talking about wokeness and, and um, all of these issues in our institutions. We're not stoking anything. Mm. If we're getting on with the job, and he's got nothing to say. What does a, what, what was the phrase? A society of something or other? Just <laughs> meaningless nonsense. As if he a, says... A society of service. Ah, he says, I we'll look all, it up, I forgot it. He says, we'll all be nice to each other and all these problems will go away. That sounds like a good plan. But the big society was a bit like that. Cameron's idea, that was a bit of flop as well. Well, it possibly was before my time. Um, but the, the point is, right, you, you can go meaningless rhetoric. All he's got on anything is meaningless rhetoric, really. A big flagship speech where his main content is we should all be much nicer to each other, shouldn't we? Well done, him. Yeah, there we go. Mm. Well, on that note, Conservative MP Ben Bradley for <laughs> Mansfield, thank you for joining us in the studio. Always a pleasure.
Now, coming up, there's still weather warnings in place after many parts of Britain were battered by a storm issue. We'll get updates from some of the worst affected areas. I'm Martin Dorbney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 25 past five. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, Storm Isha has now cleared, but winds close to 100 miles an hour battered the UK as bad weather swept across Britain. The Met Office has warned of a continuing danger to lives from flying debris, with thousands suffering from power cuts and flooding. Sadly, two deaths have now been confirmed as a result of the storm, and the UK isn't going to get much relief from Storm Isha as Storm Jocelyn is forecast to bring strong winds and heavy rain to the UK tomorrow and into Wednesday. Mark White, our Homeland Security editor, has this report. On the Isle of Man overnight, images overlooking the seafront showed Storm Isha at her most powerful, whipping up the waves, sending them crashing over a main road. Despite the obvious danger, a local cyclist decided to take a late-night bike ride along the seafront. 
It was Western communities across the UK and Ireland that felt the brunt of Stormisha first. The boats in this harbour in County Dublin took a real battering from winds gusting close to 100 miles an hour. Within hours, Britain and the Republic's entire coastlines were suffering the effects of this powerful storm. From Cornwall to Brighton to Blackpool and beyond, these coastal communities are well used to winter storms, but Isha certainly packed a punch. It was felt most acutely by those still out at sea. Footage taken from a passenger on board this Stena ferry from Liverpool to Belfast, filmed as the vessel was left circling in the Irish Sea for 11 hours last night before it could safely dock in Belfast at first light this morning. And that disruption to travel has been felt very significantly on land as well. Shots from a filling station in County Meath are more reminiscent of the images during hurricane season in the US. Like here in Belfast, the storm brought down hundreds of trees onto roads and vehicles right across the country, leading to numerous road closures for a time. Across the rail network, temporary 50 mile an hour speed limits were imposed. Part of a garden shed landed by the tracks near Bell Grove Station in Glasgow. In Kent, a whole greenhouse ended up on the tracks near Westgate on Sea. Some of the most dramatic images could be seen at the end of runways across the country as air travel was badly affected. This British Airways flight into Heathrow, one of many forced to abort its landing because of the crosswinds. Oh, she's up, she's down, she's gone. On board, another aborted landing from Munich to Dublin, a taste of the terror and frustration for these passengers. This flight from Ibiza to London City was also diverted, but much to the relief of passengers, it managed to land successfully at Gatwick Airport. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Mark White, GB News. Can you imagine being aboard that plane? Well done, that pilot. I bet he won't buy a drink after that. Now, loads of you have been getting in touch. We had Ivan Sampson and Lee Anderson. Ivan Sampson, of course, is an immigration lawyer, sat in the studio with Lee Anderson earlier on. They had quite a set, too, about the notion of people being able to work. And when they're allowed into the country, sometimes even illegally, we found out at the weekend 16,000 of such people uh, have been granted the right to work in Britain, despite some of them coming here illegally. I'll put it to Lee. People have been contact contacting me saying they are tearing up their Tory party membership as a consequence. And one thing that's really upset you is the kinds of places these people might be allowed to work. I wanted to read out this comment from Susan Spencer, who got in touch with me on social media, saying, um, Lee Anderson and the show, what are you going to do about migrants in care homes? Is it right that a frail old lady has a couple of men potentially from a different culture who can't speak English, does her personal care and she becomes distressed? This could be your family member. It's completely shocking what has become of this country. And Susan, I think that is a fair point well made, a fair point that a lot of people are making. We don't know who these people are. They're being allowed to work on construction sites and in fields, in agriculture, but it's a very, very different proposition to being able to work in care homes. Our most frail, our most vulnerable, 
our elderly, oftentimes in a, in a state of confusion, of physical frailty. And who on earth are we letting in? And we're paying them 80% of the going rate of the wage. Even the Guardian today on the front page saying this is akin to slave labour. Now, if even the left, if even the liberal left, if even the refugees welcome types are saying this is concerning. And if people like Susan are getting in touch saying who are we letting take care of our most vulnerable people, we have a huge, huge talking point. And one, I don't think politicians are addressing enough. And that's why we intend to keep bringing it up here on GB News. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and six o'clock. A campaign to get children vaccinated against measles has been launched after a rise in the number of cases. So why do so many parents in certain communities fail to vaccinate their children? But first, let's get your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. The top stories this hour. Storm Jocelyn is on course to batter Britain tomorrow with the new weather front rolling in as the country recovers from Storm Isha. Two men died and tens of thousands of people are still without power after the UK was battered last night. ScotRail has announced its suspended services from 7pm tomorrow. A five-day strike by LNER train drivers next month has been called off. It comes as members of the ASLEF union prepare to launch a series of strikes and an overtime ban from next Monday in their long-running dispute over pay. LNER drivers were due to walk out from February the 5th amid speculation about new minimum service levels. Downing Street denies that the government's pursuing an anti-BBC agenda after announcing a raft of reforms as part of a review into the corporation. Under new plans, Ofcom could get more powers over BBC News website articles if they don't meet relevant broadcast standards. Government recommendations say Ofcom will be given increased oversight over the BBC's online public services. And Queen Camilla has toured a domestic violence refuge to celebrate the service's 50th anniversary. Her Majesty met staff, volunteers and families at the Swindon Domestic Abuse Support Service. And during her visit, Queen Camilla told a well-wisher that the King is fine as he prepares to undergo treatment for an enlarged prostate this week. King Charles says he's keen to go public with his condition to encourage other men to get themselves checked out. More on all those stories by heading to our website, gbnews.com. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Quick look at the markets then, and the pound buying you $1.2725 and €1.1683. The price of gold is £1,589.51 an ounce. And the FTSE 100 has closed for the day today at 7,487 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Well, your Monday is about to get a lot happier because joining me now is Michelle Dubry, favourite part of my show as ever, Jubes and Co. Course six till seven. Michelle, what's on your menu? And Alan Miller, there is a lot to get stuck into. These 99% mortgages uh, essentially underwritten by the government. Is this a good idea or is this just going to create more carnage in the housing markets? I also, as well, Keir Starmer, he wants to create basically um, a society of service. He wants us to do more uh, to help other people, more volunteering. It smacks of the big society, if you ask me. So I want to look at that. Also, 100 years uh, ago today was the first Labour government. Are they still the party of the working class? Uh, I also want to ask should Royal Mail be renationalised? They only want to basically work Monday to Friday now. And it's the whole thing, I've got to say, is a bit of a shambles, Martin. And last but not least, should religion be banned in schools? I'm asking because you'll be familiar, of course, with the fact that that school is now getting taken to court because it's stopping Muslim uh, pupils from praying in the playground.
Yeah, I mean, that, that is a very, very meaty menu you've got coming there, Michelle. That last one in particular, it really concerns me. The Michaela Academy, of course, is at the centre of that High Court route. There's another school as well in Leighton and East London where Palestine flags went up outside of it. I spoke to a mum um, a couple of weeks ago. I'm trying to get her back on. Do you know what? They're terrified around there. They're getting, they're in fear. Their properties are being watched. And that school was threatened with being bombed, Michelle. It's gone too far. I know. Yeah, but you see, this is what happens. When you let fanatics kind of... Uh, get away with things. So when you have a scenario where a teacher, to this day, years later, is in hiding and you allowed uh, mobs to gather outside of a school and everyone just stood there and turned a blind eye, when you allow a mum to be uh, paraded in front of some kind of weird kangaroo court, Martin, with a headscarf on because her son threw a book, I mean, when you allow things like that to happen, uh, these mobs galvanise, they get momentum, don't they? Uh, but I think this question about religion in schools is quite an interesting one and my panel's certainly have different opinions on that, that is for sure. Superb. Jubes and Co, 6 till 7, always got the guts to go where others fear to try. That's Michelle Jubery. Make sure you join her later on. Thanks, Jubes. Always a pleasure. Now, millions of parents in England are being contacted by the NHS, urged to make an appointment to have their children vaccinated against measles. And this comes as NHS England says 3.4 million children under 16 are unprotected and at risk of becoming ill. Well, joining me now is Ella Whedon, the author and journalist, and, of course, a mother. Ella, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. Measles, a disease we thought we'd stamped out, and yet now it's on the rise. Why? Well, it's got a bit of a complicated history um, in that a jab that was um, for a long time seen as sort of uncomplicated and un uncontroversial in the early 2000s suddenly garnered a lot of attention um, when the now discredited and disgraced um, man, Andrew Wakefield, um, put forward the claim that it had a link to autism. And in the early 2000s, there was a, a quite a significant uh, scare around um, the MMR jab and lots of parents, you know, quite significant numbers of parents deciding that they weren't going to get it because they were worried about this alleged link. Um, that was pretty profoundly um, discredited. He was struck off. Um, a man who I admire very much called Dr. Mike Fitzpatrick, who is a GP, wrote a book called MMR and Autism, What Parents Should Know. People should look it up if they want to know more about mm. that. Um, and so that sort, of, that sort of happened. But there has also been a sort of rise of... Um, you know, anti-vax is a term that now is a little bit sullied, but genuine sort of anti-vaccination sentiment uh, mixed in with a sort of, you know, there's a bit, there's a kind of a health food trend. There's a sort of trend within the NHS itself, which suggests that you should, you know, fix your own body before turning to medicine. And then, of course, we had the pandemic uh, through which um, a sort of what should have been a, a well-handled and organised and... Um, uncontroversial rollout of a uh, medical procedure, a vaccination, we know turned into this huge political hot potato. And I think we're seeing some of the ramifications of that mishandling of the vaccination program now, which is that a lot of people feel skeptical, a lot of people feel mistrustful, and that's a very damaging situation to be in. Um, the interesting thing about a sort of uh, hesitancy around vaccinations is that you get this sort of weird unholy mix of the kind of middle class mums that I see at Stay and Plays in Hackney who, you know, get their kids to wear uh, beads for teething and, you know, think that rubbing onions on their foot are going to cure colds and that kind of thing. You know, sort of like middle class hippieism. Um, and then there's sort of the uh, large sections of immigrant population who are not, you know, quite mistrustful of doctors, don't have a good relationship with the NHS and all the rest of it. And we do have a bit of a problem. I think I'd temper it by saying we've had dips, you know, peaks and dips in relation to vaccine take up for quite some time. Um, and again, Michael Fitzpatrick is really good to look up if you want to know about the sort of scaremongering mm. around it. But it is a problem that we need to encourage people to get their kids vaccinated because measles is a nasty, nasty disease and we don't want it to be coming, uh, becoming the norm.
Ella, I want to pick up on that cultural issue because, again, during the COVID pandemic, we saw a, a quite a large disparity between ethnic minorities not taking the vaccine. Um, often that was looked historically. They had a bad, uh, bad history, uh, perhaps in, in their original country, with the vaccines. And there's a report in the Sunday Times yesterday saying in Birmingham, because where this outbreak is, the Somalian community and the Bangladeshi community are, are especially resistant to taking vaccines because they simply don't don't trust them. And that's a real problem. I mean, we need to ask ourselves the question, you know, why is the NHS and local GPs and health services unable to communicate with these communities properly? You know, why is it that um, something that is should be as run of the mill as childhood vaccinations um, are in some you know parts of the some parts of the country once kids get to school you know vaccination rates are as low as seventy percent which then causes some really big problems for herd immunity and you know keeping kids safe because you always know that there are there's a certain proportion of people who aren't going to take them and you know short of sort of coercive um, intervention you can't fix that and no one. Certainly, no one wants that. That's a lesson we learned from the pandemic, and um, that coercion yeah. is bad. But there's, it's, it's. I think it's a means of sort of communication and just not patronising people, not spending loads of money on ridiculous public health campaigns, but just the normal hard sort of work of local services, getting in contact with families and making it happen. And Ella, um, I was always against the idea of mandatory vaccinations because I think liberty comes first. But a lot of people are very quiet now about the fact that certain communities aren't taking a vaccine which may endanger their children. Do you think we have some double standards here? Well, I think we've got to be careful about sort of turning this into and the idea that this is all... I, I don't for a second think you're suggesting this, Martin, but that it's just Somali community's fault that this is no, uh, that, that the, these outbreaks are happening. I mean, you know, there has been there's been a kind of a lot of ugly discourse on social media recently about um, who and who isn't taking up the vaccine and whose fault this is. Um, like I said, it's a kind of a weird mix. And I think the an interest the something that I'm interested in uh, doing some work in relation to maternity care and uh, other areas of the NHS is we've got this sort of growing trend in the NHS that uh, the, the narrative is you shouldn't really need medicine. Uh, you should be, whether it's sort of managing your weight, stopping smoking, blah, 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 eating your five fruit and veg a day, um, that really the responsibility for your health, it, it totally is with you. And I think part of that fosters a sort of sense of a mistrust of medicine, a mistrust of medical intervention, okay. which then you can see how that leads to normal people who are ed educated and you know pay attention to experts thinking well actually I'll pass on that and you know that okay. I think that's that's something that we should that we should look into okay thank you Ella Whedon we have to leave it there thank you very much Ella Whedon on on vaccine hesitancy and the measles outbreak still to come some leading supermarkets are targeting teenagers to take up their club card is that a good thing or is it gross manipulation of their data I'm Martin Daubney on GB News for this news channel GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces. Scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? In your mouth. OK. Here comes a, here comes a train. <laughs> Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, it's 5.47. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, if you're a supermarket shopper, and who isn't, chances are very high that you'll use some sort of club or loyalty card, which allows access to better and cheaper deals, or at least it's meant to. The Tesco Club card paved the way for other major supermarkets to follow, but you have to be 18 or over to get one meaning many kids and teenagers are left paying more for their food or drinks. So, do kids need club cards? Or is it just another ploy to give away their data from a young age? Well, joining now to discuss this is Tash Courtney-Smith, retail expert and, and executive producer of Biz Kids, a show for young people covering business and finance. That sounds excellent. Welcome to the show, Tash. Tash, this got me going today because um, a report was in The Times saying that an increasing number of teenagers are badgering their parents for club cards because, of course, when they get their meal deals in the morning, especially they have their own pocket money, the deals, the cheap deals are only available to club card holders. So, should kids be having them, is it a good thing or is it dangerous because the supermarkets just want to harvest your data and direct market? Well, first of all, I think we should give a round of applause to all the young people who've realised that in order to be more financially efficient, they should have a club card. Of course, it's not ideal that Tesco's own rules prohibit club cards for kids under 18, but I think all of us who shop can understand why a young person might want a club card. I think invariably when there's large companies like supermarkets involved, it can always seem sort of like a cynical ploy, a marketing thing. Is this data harvesting of children from a young age? Certainly certainly as you've described it. However, I think there's another factor at play here, which is to think about the world that kids live in and how digitally savvy they are and how much they understand and what they're not being taught in schools. In Biz Kids, our whole mission is teaching entrepreneurship, financial literacy, and personal development to children, really from the ages of eight. And kids today are incredibly enterprising. One thing I'm not sure that people are aware of is this generation, the so-called Generation Alpha, are more enterprising and financially astute and um, entrepreneurial than any generation before. And that's because of the access they have with phones and the internet, which means it's not surprising that the kids have got wind of the club card and the advantages that you might get if you were to have one. 
And Tash, one thing that really leapt out of me here is that amongst Generation Z, that's younger shoppers, 43% of them have a loyalty card, as opposed to only 17% of baby boomers, older people. So they are getting very popular with younger people. But I put this to you, Tash. So many of the deals now I see in supermarkets, you have to have a club card or you get ripped off. They're putting the prices in, 141 products I saw um, in a witch report for six months above the actual retail price. So you're getting stung without a card, which kind of trammels us all into getting these blooming cards, even if you don't want one. Well, I mean, that's just, that is what we'd call great marketing, I suppose, isn't it? And the rise of the club card and how popular it's be become amongst consumers is, you know, an act, a massive fact. And it's not surprising. This is, to some extent, we are all tram railed, as you put it, into loyalty programs like, the, like club cards for our own financial advantage. I think what's interesting is the debate around when you should and could have a club card. And it's quite confusing to see how Tesco, Tesco themselves can not allow club cards to under 18 and then have a rise in under 18s who want one. That's something they're going to need to iron out internally and take a position on. OK, Tash Courtney-Smith, retail expert and executive producer of BizKids. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. Now the BBC is to get tougher scrutiny on their online content over concerns about bias within the organisation. And that's according to Lucy Fraser, who has said audiences think the corporation is not, quote, sufficiently impartial. You don't say. Well, the culture secretary was also asked about GB News during her appearance on Radio 4 this morning. Let's turn to uh, another part of the broadcasting landscape, which is GB News. Um, while loss-making, GB News has built a, a significant following, both on linear TV and online. Would you agree with the assertion that it has transformed our broadcasting landscape? I'm in favour of media plurality, and what that means is that there's a wide variety of views across um, uh, out there for people to watch and listen to, so that audiences uh, can find the views that they want to hear. And GB News is an important part of that landscape. It's decided to be regulated by Ofcom, as indeed many other broadcasters have, but I think it's really important that we have that uh, variety of views. Well, joining us to discuss this is columnist David Oslin. David, welcome to the show. The BBC once again under fire. Let's cut to the chase. Do you think the BBC licence fee should be scrapped, David? I don't know. I think um, the BBC is the best broadcaster in the world and on the whole does a very good job on balanced political coverage. But if Lucy Fraser wants to talk about perceived bias, I mean... We can look at some of the track record of some of its senior figures. We have a director general who uh, was former chair of Hammersmith and Fulham Conservative Association and the Tory Council candidate. Um, that's Tim Davey, of course, who set up an £800,000 loan for Boris Johnson. We have a former chairman, Robert Sharp, who was an advisor to Johnson and an advisor to Sunak, who made a 400000 Donation to the Conservative Party. We have a director, Robbie Gibb, who used to be head of comms for Theresa May. So uh, if we're talking about perceptions of bias, and I think the left certainly can share those perceptions. But David, the BBC viewers, who are the backbone of this report, are saying they feel the content is biased against the working classes, biased against white people, biased against Brexiteers. <laughs> I just don't see if there's any objective basis for any of those um, assertions. And we can all say, I can say, I perceive the BBC political coverage to be biased against the left. Um, you'd expect me to say that, wouldn't you? Not especially, but, I mean, are you saying then that the BBC viewers' concerns aren't valid because you don't agree with them? Valid concerns, but, I mean, the BBC has got a balancing act to make. Instead of being um, a propaganda channel for one side of the argument, it strives for balance. I mean, some of its okay. content will upset some viewers. Others, other, others of its content will upset other viewers. I mean, it goes with the territory, I guess. I mean, as okay, you David, should I'm, know. I'm, I'm afraid in the interest of balance, we have to leave it there. But thank you very much for joining us on the show. I've been Martin Dorman. I'll be back tomorrow, 3 till 6. But right after the break, Jubes & Co, 6 till 7 p.m. Thanks for joining me today. Have a happy Monday evening. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News.
Afternoon, I'm Alex Deakin. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Storm Isha is out of the way, but Storm Jocelyn is on the way for later tomorrow with the strongest winds across the northern half of the UK. There is Isha exiting up towards Norway, but Jocelyn is brewing out in the Atlantic. We're between these two storm systems at the moment. Still quite windy out there this evening. Plenty of showers being blown in on that brisk wind as well. Some heavy ones continuing over Scotland, but for many places it'll become dry and clear overnight. And the winds will continue to ease down a little. That could allow temperatures to get down to freezing in rural parts of Scotland, but for most of us, we'll stay a little above freezing at three or four Celsius. Here comes the next area of rain, though. A wet start for Northern Ireland. That rain will spread into Wales and southwest England before dawn as well, and then it continues to spread into Scotland, getting into eastern England by lunchtime. The heaviest rain, though, in the west, over the hills in particular, that rain could cause some problems on its own, and then the winds continue to strengthen through the day. It will will actually be a mild day, but it won't feel all that mild as those winds continue to pick up. So a storm jostling moves in. This is through Tuesday evening into Wednesday morning. We have warnings in place. The strongest winds across the northern half of the country. The rain, as I said, could also cause some issues. We have an amber warning covering northern and western parts of Scotland for gusts maybe up to 80 miles an hour and a broader yellow warning. Some disruption is possible from storm jostling. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests, and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out.
with my panel here on Jubes & Co. We debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good evening to you, I'm Michelle Jubry and this is Jubes & Co. Coming up tonight, we all know now not being able to afford a house is a massive issue for many. The government then is proposing guaranteeing a 99% mortgage. What do you reckon to that? Is that the answer to the housing wars or will it basically just make things worse? And in a speech to DK Starmer says he wants us to become, I quote, a society of service, to do more to help our fellow man. It all sounds a little bit kind of Cameron big society yes to me. Look how that ended up. Also, did you know it was 100 years today since the first Labour government? Are they still the party for the working class? And do you remember who their first Prime Minister was? Don't Google it, but you can get your answers on a postcard. And speaking of postcards, let's face it, Royal Mail is in a bit of a pickle, not least because they only want to start delivering Monday to Friday only. What is wrong with the work attitude in this country? Is it time now for the Royal Mail to be renationalised? And a school has been taken to court for refusing to let Muslim pupils 